And with that, I would like to bring up, well, he's actually standing right here beside me, um, the OBO Director Ambassador William H. Moser. Uh, let's see, I can't, I don't want to take too much time to get into his bio, but just suffice it to say, a twice ambassador, prior experience in OBO, management counselor, procurement logistics, uh, extremely seasoned foreign service officer, so with a breadth of expertise across all of the aspects and all the facets of work that OBO does in service of our customers overseas. So with that, sir, okay, the floor is you. yours. Thank you. Uh. Well, thank you all for that. And Victoria, thank you for the wonderful introduction. But whenever I hear the season word, I think I am probably past my sell-by date and I should be removed from the shelf. Uh, because I may actually be around a little too long. I've actually had 39 years in the Foreign Service, and I will say it has been a wonderful career for me. And it has given me a chance to really assemble many of the experiences living overseas and working in the buildings, uh, working in the buildings that we, the OBO, now manage, uh, has given me an extreme amount of experience in knowing what we should do in order to serve our customer base. And for today's uh, short remarks, what I would like to do uh, is first of all, thank you for all, all for being here. And we had a wonderful peer uh, discussion this morning. We're looking forward to having a great discussion with the whole industry uh, uh, this afternoon. And we really look forward to hearing from you. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about Oboe's mission. I've recently, re or we have recently rewritten our mission statement and it's 11 words. Oboe, sir, uh, Oboe provides the most effective facilities for United States diplomacy abroad. Now, the reason I wanted to say it this way is this. Do we still do security? Yeah, we still do security. Do we do climate resilience? Yeah, we do that. Do we do architecture, good architecture? Yeah, we do that. Uh, do we build uh, good mechanical systems? Yeah, we do all of that. But none of you can't be effective unless you do all of those things. And the one thing that I think that we had lost in our focus of our organization was that OBO's job is to make sure that we're always thinking about the, uh, our first task, which is to take care of our customers overseas. We have 100,000 diplomatic personnel that OBO serves. And we need to remember that OBO's job is to make sure that we provide those people working so hard out in the field with the, the facilities that they need in order to execute what is our core mission, which is the conduct of American diplomacy. Now, uh, to give you an idea of how I would like this to, uh, uh, to develop over the next years, and I'm asking my staff for a mentality change, and I'll ask the, our, our industry group here today for the same one. We don't want to be known as the Overseas Buildings Organization as much as we want to be known as the Facility Solutions Organization or the Facility Solutions Program. Because what we're trying to do is do every part of our program in order to say is, you've got a problem at your post that deals with your uh, physical platform. What facility solution can we offer in order to give you what you need so that you can continue to effectively conduct the diplomacy? Uh, one of the things to keep in mind in this, something I have to tell everybody, uh, you know, all know football and basketball. Well, let me tell you something. Diplomacy is a contact sport. Because if you can't be close enough to be in the room and really see the reaction of your contact on your, uh, of the person you're talking to, the reaction on his or her face, and you can't actually have that, that, uh, that up close conversation, you're not doing your job as a diplomat. Because if it were all able to do it by Zoom, you could actually do it uh, from the United States. and We wouldn't need uh, uh, em uh, employees overseas. Uh, the, many of you are old enough to remember when Ross Perot ran for president. He said, you know, I could replace the State Department with a fax machine. <laughs> that all we have to do would see faxes all over the world and, and, and tell foreign governments. Problem about that is, at that point, that's the problem. You're telling foreign governments what you want, to, uh, what you uh, want them to hear, instead of listening to what they have to say. And the essence of diplomacy is actually having a dialogue with your audience, not preaching at them, but having a, a dialogue with them. So, what our job, 
Our job is to make sure that we can make that dialogue happen. Um, I want to say, though, that, uh, 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 that one of the things that I shared in depth with the peers this morning, and I think it's worthwhile telling the whole group, um, if you read the, 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 the popular press, you know the government is having serious budget uh, discussions. Oboe has not been exempt from this. To give you an idea about where we are as an organization, uh, when I was in Oboe before, from 2015 to 2018, our budget was, uh, was around four to four and a half uh, uh, billion dollars. Our budget now is barely hitting three billion. And the, and the signs that we get from our interlocutors on Capitol Hill, and I meet with all four of our committees quarterly, is that our budget prospect is going to be fairly bleak for the years ahead. This is not uh, necessarily a good sign, uh, and we know that we're going to have to deal with it. In fact, uh, 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 in fact we, are, we realize that uh, this is going to call for serious change. Now, if we were in a private company, one of the things uh, that we would immediately go to is reduce our personnel costs. In other words, we would start uh, uh, cutting down on the member, number of staff members we have. But that's not what we want to do because we feel that we really need our staff in order to continue doing the things that, that the American taxpayer and our, uh, and our other stakeholders expect us to do. So. Uh, what do I want to do and what do uh, I think we want to do in terms of my entire organization is we have to reinvent ourselves. We have to decide how we can go through all of the cost items, every line item in every project that we do and think how we can reduce the cost. Now part of this is doing that line item examination, but much of it is actually making ourselves more infect effective internally. And this is a challenge for every employee in, uh, in Obo, and it's particularly for my managing directors who are all here today. We have to think about what we can uh, look at all of our processes and decide what's our core function and what do we need to do and what do we, uh, and really give up those things that may not be so important. But there's also a couple things that enter in into any government bureaucracy that uh, we can cut out immediately. One of those, uh, and this has been my hobby horse of the week, has been something I affectionately call churn. We spend a lot of time re-examining the same questions over and over and over again. And I realize that if we're going to be effective, we have to go ahead and actually accelerate our decision-making process. If you want to cut out uh, the, uh, the money you're spending on things, make faster decisions. And I am all for, even though technically I, I'm supposed to decide almost everything in the organization, uh, I am more than happy to, sit, uh, to push down that responsibility to my managing directors and even lower to make sure that we get better results by just making sure that the decisions are actually uh, uh, made faster. Now, uh, part of the reluctance, it's been amazing to me in looking at the, the psychological profile of, the, uh, of Oboe's uh, uh, staff. They don't like to say no to people. And it's just amazing to me uh, because, uh, because, you know, I've been a management counselor or worked in these positions at Post Overseas, and yeah, I wanted to say yes as much as I could. But sometimes a quick no and letting people what and, man, and managing that quick no and managing people's expectation is a better answer. Rather than string people along for months at a time thinking that they're going to, uh, uh, to get some project from Oboe, it's better to tell them not on the priority list. Which leads me to the way we're trying to fight this. One of the things that you will see, and our industry partners will notice this very quickly, is that we are going to have a prioritization process for every project in the organization. It will not only be for our capital projects, it will be for all of our small projects too. And the reason why we want to do this is to essentially say that we know we have a limited amount of money and probably a declining resource base. So what do we need to do in order to adapt to that? We need to make sure that we are only focusing on the things that, are, that deserve priority funding. 
And this is, these things can have to be done and will be done through essentially just re, uh, internal reorganization with, uh, within OBO. Another aspect of that is business process improvement. Now, I'm a huge fan of business process improvement, and I engaged in it extensively the five years that I was the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for, uh, for Logistics Management. And we came out in logistics management with really a world-class uh, delivery, uh, 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 delivery system to where we could actually track all our freight around the world and a warehousing system that matched and also procurement tools that actually matched all of that. It can be done and I've seen it done in government and I realize that by actually getting a better hold of our business process and, and having more standardized practices, we can make OBO a, 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 a more effective organization. Remember, it's only the effective organization that can better provide that effective facility for the post overseas. We will be investing in new software. And the reason for this is we are currently doing something that many government agencies do and use, uh, use legacy programs that cost a lot of money to maintain because they have been so customized over the years that they've essentially uh, started to, uh, the, the, essentially we own the program, but we also own a program that's a bad program. So uh, moving on to modern uh, software tools that are actually industry standards is one of the, the transitions we will uh, m uh, make over the, uh, over the next year. And for those of you that use our tools and interact with us, you will see many of the things that we're using now start to be replaced and go to essentially commercial off-the-shelf software with the idea that we will not customize this software. Because we have to start to realize, and, and I really say this in, in a, a very direct way, in people that want to customize software need to get over themselves. Uh, because what you want to do in a customized fashion probably isn't necessary. In other words, that your business process is bad. And so that's the reason you want to customize it. And what I'm going to refuse to do, or what we're going to refuse to do, because uh, is we're not going to customize bad business processes. In other words, we have to fit in uh, uh, with the products we buy. And we think at the end of the day, we'll actually save money. Uh, I think that one of the uh, things I should, would like to mention, though, uh, is that the big, the, 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 use a really colloquial phrase, this is the big uh, enchilada. In my own view, in the years where we had these huge budgets, we tried to paper over our problems by, by, uh, by spending more money. That we thought, well, if it's a mistake and you've got a four and a half billion dollar budget, then, oh, well, this only costs a hundred, uh, this only costs a million to fix or two million, and the money started to lose its value. And I think that we stopped being good stewards of the taxpayer's money because we forgot what it means to, have, to really to adhere to scope, schedule, and budget. Really the basic uh, tenets of the construction industry or the project management industry. Scope, schedule, and budget. And so what the real challenge is, is for every employee of, uh, in OBO and for every contractor that works with us, is how are we going to uh, pay more attention to these things to make sure that we are actually getting better adherence to the whole idea of scope, schedule, and budget. And that with a customer focus and thinking what our highest goal is, is what to do the best facility solution for our overseas workforce, what can we uh, uh, do in order to achieve that? And that's where all of you come in. So what we're going to be looking for henceforth is you're going to see us talking about the oboe reinventing itself, and I've said that. But we're also going to be looking for industry partners that can partner with us to go back and look at these basics. How do we reduce our time frames? Can you produce the product that we need in, uh, uh, more quickly? Can you actually uh, give us suggestions about unnecessary scope? And we're even having an extensive dialogue about all our scope, whether it be the mechanical systems that are our building or many of our security requirements. And the reason why we have to do this is because Congress is saying we must do it. So we don't really have a choice, but we want to join in partnership with you and use your expertise working with us 
in order to take oboe into a more modern, uh, uh, and turn oboe into a more modern organization. And then I think that together, we can work together to find those facility solutions that will really enable American diplomacy for the 21st century. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. So uh, one of the things that Ambassador Moser did not say was the word transparency, but when he goes to the Hill, when he talks to our four committees, um, he's talking every bit as frankly with them as he is today with you, and I think that's a hallmark of his leadership and his stewardship of the organization. Um, and in that, with that sort of perspective in mind, uh, last year we provided at this forum a uh, session on uh, Grace Farms and on, <clears throat> uh, let's see, shoot. Design for Freedom, thank you, thank you. Of course, it would be helpful if I have the right set of notes up here. But, um, so to carry that thread from last year to this year and to sort of demonstrate that we're gonna keep uh, maintaining transparency with you um, and with our industry partners, I'd like to bring up Curtis Clay, our Director of Architecture, for that update. Thank you. When they asked me to come speak, they didn't tell me I was going to be following Director Moser, so thanks, Lauren, for that there. Um, so last year, uh, OBO made this commitment with Grace Farms, which is the nonprofit uh, organization based in New Haven, Connecticut, and celebrating their Design for Freedom initiative, which has the audac audacious mission to eradicate mo modern slavery from the built environment. With a global portfolio of projects in design and construction totaling approximately $20 billion, uh, OBO realized that we have the potential to really move the needle by working together to raise awareness, create institutional changes to shift the industry towards ethically sourced building materials. In March, we were invited to speak at the Design for Freedom Summit and have since joined the Design for Freedom working groups where we've collaborated with many industry leaders on ways to accelerate this movement and bring a radical paradigm shift towards ethical building material supply chains. Last week, leadership from our construction management office, Tracy Thomas, myself, and the Office of Trafficking and Persons met with representatives of the Senate uh, to share updates on our partnership after Ambassador, Ambassador Moser mentioned it at his quarterly briefing. Uh, they were extremely supportive of our effort. They were inquisitive on material supply chain sourcing we had a really robust conversation on the challenges of legislating our way to a solution. Also in that meeting, we shared information about our external engagements and OBO's partnership with the Department of State's Trafficking in Persons Office, where we are rolling out two new efforts focusing on preventing and assessing the risks of human trafficking in the construction sector. We are developing risk management tools that are tailored for the construction industry and due diligence tools specifically for State Department procurement in construction. A resource developed by Trafficking in Persons, which is now live and can be used by everyone, is the Responsible Sourcing Tool, which can be found at responsiblesourcingtool.org. Easy to remember. Um, so this will serve as a publicly accessible resource to assist architects, engineers, and contractors to better identify, prevent, and address human trafficking in their supply chains. The website contains a set of comprehensive risk management tools, such as a supplier self-assessment and a sample compliance plan. So together we have developed a pilot procurement tool specifically to test a more focused approach to risk assessment and contract monitoring, which we plan to roll out hopefully later this year. Again, that's responsiblesourcingtool.org. Coming up this November, we're going to be co-sponsoring the Design for Freedom Ethical Supply Chain Workshop, which is gonna be held at Grace Farms where we'll be assessing the state of the industry and examining these best practices by bringing together thought partners and industry experts from the public and private sectors. The overriding goal of this event is to provide an open forum to share information, and we envision this workshop to really be an important step to ensure that there's more effective policies, laws, processes, and systems are developed that can be practical and actually implementable. So we believe outreach and education are really vital to this effort and sitting down with contracting partners and contractors that work with us is really gonna be key 
to moving this forward. Lastly, we are examining projects within our existing portfolio to find a good candidate to implement the new lead pilot credit, social equity within the supply chain. Um, working with the United States Green Building Council, uh, we've understood this credit mandates the use of at least three permanently installed products from at least two different manufacturers that are from a company that complies with verified standards that meet all eight fundamental conventions of the International Labor Organization, otherwise known as the ILO. The ILO conventions cover stages of raw materials extraction, processing, manufacturing, and assembly of components and products. So we're very excited about this progress that we've had over the past year. Um, I want to personally commend Director Moser for his leadership and really pushing us to move this from uh, an aspirational goal to something that's actually implementable, which we've, I think we've made some strides on this year. Um, looking back on the tremendous progress that has occurred, we look forward to the coming year bringing us even more success. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Curtis. Um, and keeping with the theme of transparency, one of the most important roles for the peers is to review our projects, our ongoing work, and then to provide input, and then to provide a readout of how well we received, how well we listened, right? How well we received that input and what kind of changes we made uh, based on the guidance from our peers. So with that, I'd like to ask Christian Bailey, uh, director with Morris Adami Architects and Deborah Lehman Smith, founding partner of Lehman Smith McLeish, to provide us some updates on the industry advisory reviews over the last year. Okay, thanks, Victoria. And um, we, were, we need to be efficient. We've got four projects and three roundtables, so Deborah and I will work hard to get there for you all. But amazing work by the peer reviews and the teams that designed these projects. And we'll start with uh, the PRIA Cape Verde new U.S. Embassy. This was designed by Studio Ma. It's a design uh, build with bridging. Do I have the control? Oh, here we go. Okay, there it is. Uh, it's a design build with bridging documents scheduled for the year 2024. S Studio Ma provided an updated project design based on the Quintal scheme presented in the first IAR. Um, the design is organized around a large courtyard at the center of the site. Circulation to and around this courtyard is accomplished through a two-story colonnade integrated with the NOB. And the design team's commitment to consistent sustainability Strategies is key uh, of the updated scheme. The peer um, review took place for the number two on um, October 26, 2022, and that included Sandra Brock, Vice, Pre Vice Pre President, Director of Planning at Niche Engineering, uh, David Rubin, um, Founding Principal David Rubin, uh, and Land Collective, and Jim Richard. Uh, partner Richard Kennedy Architects. He is a IAG adjunct. Uh, Sandra and I spoke this morning, and she stressed how important climate and site were to this uh, this development here. And the panel also noted that Studio Ma had made significant progress on the design since the first peer review. The reviewers noted that the management of the stormwater, which you can see in the next slide. Um, uh, was, was a primary concern and felt Studio Ma's efforts to manage the site flows were successful. Uh, some of the comments that came out of that peer review was that the site design was uh, overly complex and articulated uh, with comments about how, we can, how it could be simplified and edited at the overall uh, site design. They also recommended that uh, the height uh, and design of the embassy perimeter walls uh, become a, a bit more welcoming and transparent uh, through different strategies of height and working with the public street. Also, the, the use of the basalt cladding uh, paving materials throughout the compound uh, to consider the reflectivity and heat gain that's associated with that product. Studio Ma um, also uh, was uh, asked to look at and study opportunities to strengthen the expression of the threshold and gateway at the embassy through the main pack. And then kind of leading towards the conclusion of this with the building design, the colonnade uh, should be the organizing uh, 
relative element for the program and the function and the workspaces behind it. The panel felt that the primary function of the Kintal was a gathering space for the embassy community and, the, and requested the um, studio model to look into adjusting to the security and site design that will allow it expanded use and access. Uh, also consider studying ways to connect the consular garden uh, for public events. Regarding the facade glazing articulation on the upper levels should be adjusted to, for consistency in relation to the interior functions. And then finally, the grand staircase uh, as an organizing element for the representational circulation was seen as a very successful strategy. Okay, moving on to, towards the uh, roadmap uh, to reducing embedded carbon. This was a round table that took place April 5th of this year. It included the peers, Alan Organsky, uh, Principal Gary Organsky Architects, Stacy Schmedley, uh, she's on uh, Zoom today, an Executive Director, Building Transparency, Nico uh, Krentz, Director, Atelier 10, and Nat Oppenheimer, Senior VP and Principal at Solman uh, Associates. So a few of those efforts, and I'll turn it over to Nat for his comments. Uh, overall, the direction provided by OBO is on track with the industry understanding of the embodied carbon framework. Uh, the importance of life cycle assessments was stressed throughout the, uh, the meeting. And how can case studies be utilized uh, to answer um, uh, questions and identify areas considering material sourcing, uh, shipping, and um, select locations that are worst case to drive real change. Another uh, comp component was the data sourcing. I think that was touched on a little bit earlier. And you can't measure what you don't know and you can't improve what you can't measure. So align with the current OBO initiative efforts that present current relative information, perform supply chain investigations, understand mass timber, as a systemic story that, does, that just doesn't look at carbon reduction. Uh, and then going into the project process, define the entire process for completing a project and indicate where changes can make the most impact. Reassess how OBO handles carbon impacts in standards and specifications. And also, strategies for embodied carbon reduction can be either by selecting out or designing out carbon. Selecting out, uh, referring to materials. Designing out, referring to structural efficiency and material reuse. Messaging and narrative, and then I'll turn it over to Nat. Start with OBO's strategy, strategic goals, make connections with the initiative's workflows, and utilize OBO's reach and impact to create real change across the international community. Yeah, I think you summarized it well. It was a great conversation. I think what's especially heartening in these conversations that I participate in is that OBO often gives uh, the group time and space. I think this was about a three-hour discussion or two hours. Um, and it was really an open, free-flowing conversation where everything was on the table. So those are the key uh, comments made by Ambassador Moser. I think they're living up to that ideal that they really wanted to hear everything. And, and given the reach that OBO has in the market, even at a reduced budget, it's $3 billion to $4 billion. That's significant every year. Um, and so it, we did really get way beyond the headlines of, and I'm a big fan of Mass Timber, but simply saying, okay, Mass Timber, that'll solve everything. We had a lot of discussion about simply reducing footprint, as Christian talked about, as an immediate um, reuse and maintenance of existing facilities and how we make sure we don't just tear down to rebuild new. Um, and then more action items in terms of really thinking about case studies that we could do in terms of mass timber and testing and so on to make this market ready and not just simply an aspiration. So thank Great. you for allowing me to participate. Great, thanks, Matt. And just a last statement, combine all these efforts with the international efforts, such as those at Grace Farms and Design for Freedom that Curtis was just mentioning. So Deborah, I'll turn it over to you. I turn you off. <laughs> Um, I have the pleasure to talk about uh, the new U.S. consulate in Adana, Turkey. And unfortunately, this is in procurement right now, so this is the image. So I don't have a lot of the pretty pictures of design because the hope is that it will be awarded uh, relatively soon. 
But this, the peers for this, I believe, get a huge high mark. And um, there were two design competition reviews, one on May 9th, 10th, and 11th, so a day each uh, for each team that was involved. And then back, that was for a 40% packet, and then again on July 10th, 11th, and 12th. And the peer reviewers were Anne-Marie Duval-Decker, Duval-Decker Architects, Thomas Pfeiffer, um, from Thomas Pfeiffer and Partners, and Jane Smith, who's here with us today at Space Smith. The design build teams were BL Herbert International with Page Sutherland Page and Skidmore Williams and Merrill as the design architects, Hiddell Construction with DLL Group, DLR Group as the architects, and Pernix Federal with HLK as the architects. And I think this is a really interesting um, movement into everything that we've talked about today because it's really a very different and a new approach to procurement. And what it really does is it combines at the very inception of the design and build construction the team. So it really benefits the early contractors input and pricing at um, the design development stage. And it also keeps the design architect through the process to the end of the construction, which we've talked about. And so I think that through this entire project, um, it's just not design assist, but it's really involvement to the end. And what we saw was that they really developed a very strong conceptual design. Again, 40% with a lot of peer review comments, um, dealing with the site planning hierarchy of the buildings, the space, the building, the interiors, and then a landscape strategy. And to me, what was most interesting, knowing that this is a different procurement, kind of a little bit of a test that we all call works, is that the selection is really made on the best value, not the lowest cost, and also the technical assist ability of the project and the team. So I think all of us in this room um, give you great kudos for trying something different and unique, and you have three really great teams, and we hope that the proper one is procured soon, right? Okay. So then going on to that, there was, um, following what Curtis had said, there was actually a training course work round table on construction risk mitigation. And with that, we had Brian Farland, who's a regional executive officer of Skanska, and Patrick Crosby, president of the Crosby Group. And this round table happened in May of 2022, and it was really to discuss the risk management mitigation that we're all seeing. And the topics really varied from supply chain, inspection risk, and construction work risk, and really with all the parties getting early involvement, the key takeaways really was that through this training process that now they're implementing, that really having all the teams together, understanding the issues, I know Frank, you talked about that this morning, is that um, how do we really take the risk up front in the beginning of a project, have the meetings with the contractors weekly through these new tools are able so that we can really ascertain what the risks are before they become an issue. Thanks, Deborah. Okay, moving on to the Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago. This is a new U.S. Embassy designed by Mark Cabanero Associates. Design build with bridging documents scheduled for September 2024. The Port of Spain uh, new Embassy project co-locates the existing U.S. Embassy and ancillary facilities that do not meet the current Overseas Security Policy Board and standards of embassy space needs. Uh, there were two uh, IAR, IARs this year, um, this summer. The first one took place July 14th uh, with myself, Ali Fior, Director of Rex, and David Rubin of Land Collective. Uh, the architect presented three schemes. There was the this location, I think I have this, the site and the three schemes I think are right here. These were basically a bar scheme, a split bar scheme, and then a transept scheme. They presented it um, and basically after, there was one issue with this, the first one was just the referencing of the colonial and the axial and the proce processional. And that was, that kind of translated into later designs um, 
solutions on how it can be a new, fresher approach while respecting the landscape. The landscape and the architecture are equally as important in this uh, project. And so the conclusion of that first IR was to investigate the split bar scheme and, uh, I'll, and then to um, keep developing uh, with that. They we had a second IR in, uh, in August and basically that what happened uh, virtually is about a month and a half ago and the, we really felt that the architects had uh, listened to the group and we really appreciated that as the split bar uh, scheme comprises of two discernible rectangles and here, you can see it on the site there, two discernible rectangles, um, each in reinforcing functional areas of the landscape with different orientations relative to the site perimeter. The team elected to develop the landscape in a naturalistic plan instead of the more formal uh, colonial referenced plan that um, sort of existed before with the axial points. Um, and celebrating the prominent trees for the preservation and the rich landscape of the local species, which also complemented the um, aesthetic of the building. Um, and then the building also included these screening strategies for shade development to augment the landscape areas and views in and out. And landscape was such an important part. I think David always summarizes things well with landscape and how would you describe it? It's Landscapes in these contexts, uh, as rich as they are, are written to be read, and they're read by many, whether they're the people that exist there on a daily basis, come under concern for getting a visa or pass by there, never having stepped foot on the site. And this team did an extraordinary job in understanding and appreciating the value that that brings to the context of, of, of the landscape and the, the OBO in general. All right, thanks. And that the use of that seminia tree as the focus and pivot coming from the west instead of from the south, and then also the storm water management. Um, there's still work to be done with that, but that was a critical part of the review. Um, we also felt that there was opportunity to separate the public and private functions that was really attractive with the split bar scheme. And you know, moving forward, you know, it's, it concept was just done, working on clarifications of the expression of the two buildings. Um, to provide a, a clear separation. Um, the main entry to the south we felt was successfully um, improved and widened, now gracious, and um, the way you proceed into this was uh, greatly improved and a big part of it. And the landscape also affords um, an area for these cultural events outside with the cultural symbol of the tree. Um, just a few other comments were with the buildings develop the screen um, and to maybe relate it to something with context or nature or something relevant to be more specific. The, the screening um, apertures with the light and the materials and tones of the buildings um, with that. However, overall with the sunscreen shading strategies, we felt it was very effectively done uh, with the perce perception of the massing of the building and addressing the harsh solar environment. And then with the CACs, this is common with a lot of other projects. How does that relate to the new embassy building versus just an extension of the perimeter wall? So thank you. The next advisory review was for the um, new U.S. Embassy and U.S. Mission to the EU in Brussels. And the architect is Kiernan Timberlake. It happened on uh, August 15th of this past year. And the um, team also included uh, Olin as the architectural landscape design team. The industry review group is uh, Nader Tarani, principal of NADA. Marian Weiss, uh, co-founder of Weiss Manfredi, Alan, Alan Organsky, the principal of Gary Organsky, and Sandra Bach, uh, vice president of Mission Engineer, who's been very busy on all of these, by the way. 
And the goals really for this, and because it isn't just an embassy, but it's also the U.S. mission to the EU, it was clearly to create something that symbolizes democracy and represents the embassy of the U.S. and the U.S. mission to the European Union. As we look to the future, to really create flexible and efficient space, to respect the Brussels context in the neighborhood of Etterbeek, to ensure safe, secure landscaping um, around the building, minimizing the visual presence of it and a context to the neighborhoods that it's within, and to create quality workspace with daylight and views to the European standards, to achieve carbon reduction and resilience goals informed by the Belgium and European standards as well, um, and clearly the needs of a modern embassy and really work within um, the limitations of an existing site and to be able to ascertain the value out of that existing site as much as they possibly could. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marianne Weiss, who is a peer reviewer for this. Marianne, why don't you let us know uh, the conclusions of this? Thank you, Deborah. Um, what was very exciting about this particular uh, location and particular aspiration is that it it is in a neighborhood of which it will be the largest thing uh, to be seen. And in its strong figural representation, uh, there were three uh, schemes that were developed with the two constraints, the OBO setback obligations, but also the local zoning or PPAS compliant. If we go to the, um, uh, if we look at the site here, you can see that there was an existing building that was enormous uh, on the site. So to uh, the benefit of this, we've got the benefit of uh, the excavation that's already been done, and so we are getting that sort of reduced embodied carbon, if you will, to take advantage of. Uh, and Kieran Timberlake did an extraordinary job then. If you look at the th trio of schemes of really looking um, in rigorous terms at how to utilize that lateral uh, extent uh, where they could, and you could see what the excavation enabled them to do that was sort of pre-existing. But if we look at the trio of schemes, they looked at uh, the strategies uh, in three ways. First, the one that was most compliant with the local zoning as well as the OBO zoning and made a tight tower, if you will, in the middle of the site. Um, and from there, it was working off the receded plinth. Um, and in this case, what they were trying to do was actually enable the growth or densification within the footprint of the building. Um, concept two was moving a little bit outside of the compliance with the uh, local uh, zoning, if you will, to create something that had a little bit more of a relaxed fit on the site, uh, which was a courtyard scheme. This one, though, had the opportunity to be able to tune its orientation and also its scale and legibility as a park on the adjacent side as it uh, moved down Nautilus style um, to the right-hand side, if you see the middle diagram. And the last one they were really calling distributed hubs, which was trying to take some of the efficiency of the first scheme, but also some of the opportunities of riffing on the kind of uh, organic uh, inspiration of Brussels' uh, noted Art Nouveau uh, aesthetic traditions, and start to see if there could be something uh, of an opportunity there to orient views and vistas to primary uh, landmarks that are to the periphery seen from this uh, really high site. Um, our team uh, of reviewers found that there was enormous uh, intelligence to each one of them, but in terms of the greatest opportunity, while the middle scheme with its courtyard, the six-sided courtyard, had some intrinsic inefficiencies with distributed cores, the Nautilus was the most sympathetic and offered actually the greatest flexibility for phase growth over time, particularly with the do, the, 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 uh, both the growth and also the um, the future uh, uh, homes that would need to potentially be accommodated, but not immediately. Um, so by looking hard, we suggested that by looking hard at the efficiencies in both the first and the third scheme, by making some aspect of it not a list to have exaggerated height and, and drop, that one could acquire the efficiencies and all the, um, uh, if you will, elegance of its site specificity and also be an economical final concept. Thank you. And the next was a round table, which is really the precursor for the discussion we're going to have after this. But it was a hybrid workplace round table. And its title was Mission, Money, and Motivation. Like, who wouldn't love that? Um, every, every, you know, business person in the United States right now or the world. And this happened on August 18th. 
Dan Matthews and actually the entire group that were the peer reviewers uh, are here today. Dan Matthews, president of Matthews Associates, Maureen Ehrenberg, CEO, Blue Sky, IBE, IAG peer, uh, Jane Smith, partner Space Smith, and Christopher Budd, principal of Studios. And the IAG peers discussed a variety of topics relating to the hybrid workplace, which really is really the foremost in all of our minds today. As we look at scope change and how we work and what the future is, its power, this disruption that it's caused, and how real estate is repositioning because of it. Some key takeaways were looking at the past, present, and future workplace, and then responding to a glut of underutilized real estate, which was our discussion at lunch. What can we do and how do we devise solutions for the realigned usage and the power of the workplace in general? And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Maureen Ehrenberg to give us the topic and then really a prelude to this afternoon. Thank you. The way we just, uh, looked at this was we first started with the profound change uh, that is and continues to go on, but that's already occurred. And if you think about it, some people think that it's over. And what we're saying is is that it was almost like being on a roller coaster when a dip, but we're actually on an up, up, uphill uh, climb to something that's going to be much more profound to us going forward and how we could prepare for that to manage the risk. So there's a lot of learnings we felt out of the retail sector. Uh, retail had to reposition itself as an asset class several um, years ago, and in the office context and in the real estate space context, it is clear that um, people talk about the war for talent. Uh, the war is over and the employees have won. So hybrid and remote work, the cloud workforce uh, continues to evolve. So a key learning from all of this is that the culture of work and the space and the place need to respond to the employees rather than employees responding to the work and to respond to the customers and their experience and the experiential, uh, happen everything through design to the way it's facilitated. Um, when we looked at what's changed, uh, it's responsiveness to the diverse needs, experiences, work styles, and types of the work base and also the customers. Technology, we looked at software and applied technologies to create digital ecosystems and more dynamic workplaces so people can kind of control their own environment rather than it being some centrally managed uh, through facilities. So it's more of a distributed uh, use of technology. And then ultimately, we talked about the fourth industrial revolution, where we really have moved more to an experience and economy and a digital economy where people are looking for flexibility, fluidity, and to be frictionless, so to be very agile. And part of this was just transforming brick and mortar through whether it's internet, web, blockchain, managing risk, looking at ESG, and ultimately how are people using communication tools like Teams, like Slack, which is also creating this digital environment. In the end, we then looked at what is this doing to real estate. When we look at return to office, we look at the ESG drivers, and at the end of the day, we looked at some of the studies that have been done where top of mind for the real estate community are rising interest rates, a looming potential recession, and how hard is it going to be or soft, uh, the concern about additional bank failures and return to office, and you know, just considering that a trillion dollars of commercial real estate mortgage maturities are projected through 2024 against 4.5 trillion of outstanding mortgages. They've also uh, looked at 2030 uh, net zero carbon goals that have to be additional investment in these properties, many of which are, uh, they have physical occupancy, so to speak, but the fact is that no one's in the buildings. There's only about 25 to 40% showing up and 80% uh, of the U.S. office stock was built before 1994. So this is the context for the discussion later. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. I think this is one of the key elements today that we're all facing of how do we change. And all of us look forward to the next 30 minutes when you delve in a little more. So that's the end of the readouts and the peer reviews. Thank you. Well, I would like to, yeah. <laughs> And I would like to thank you, Deborah, Kristen, Maureen, for the readouts, to all the peers for being on the IARs and the, uh, the panels and the trainings, because this is, we're in the room where it happens, right? This is where, you know, we're, we're, we're coming together, we're communicating, we're sharing ideas. This is an exchange, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. Um, and I, I'm hoping to now take that discussion that we started, which I, I think focused 
um, on learning in the domestic U.S. market and see if we can lift ourselves up and out, transcend boundaries. Um, and, I, and it was a bit tongue in cheek, you know, workspace, the new frontier. And I didn't realize I was mixing my, you know, love boat and Star Trek metaphors when, we, you know, we sort of put the titles. But, you know, but the idea being, this is this is this isn't really new. Um, and so, but it's but all of the things that we've been talking about today really put us at a point in time. Um, I think the secretaries referred to it as an inflection point, but really, the, the, it's at a point in time where we have to begin to look at really drastic ways we can do things differently. So. Uh, I think you all, and so I'll invite, this is, this is now the scrum portion, peers, you know, get the, the you know, put your arm pads on or whatever. Um, this, there's really no, I mean, while we'll rely on, on Dan and Maureen and Christopher and Jane to, to help, uh, help guide us, but uh, really it's for, it's for anyone. But Director Moser said earlier today, diplomacy is a contact sport. And so imagine you've got your diplomats, and, and what we do, right, is we go and we create them, Port of Spain, Brussels, Praia, we create them a building and we give them a seat and we assign them to that seat, right? So, so is there a disconnect? I, I, my theory is that there's a bit of a disconnect between what we're doing and how we're enabling them to meet the mission to provide diplomacy overseas. So I guess the, the question I'd like to throw open uh, you know, to anyone, we've got this incredible power in the workplace to, to design and create spaces where people want to come together, they want to collaborate, um, and yet perhaps in some of the design standards, design guidelines, things that we've done, um, we might be putting some, some roadblocks um, up in terms of, of how we facilitate that, that interaction. Um, and I think it was Jane who said, um, that, that even libraries now are taking into consideration, you know, quiet floors, medium quiet floors, super noisy floors, floors where you can get food in libraries. Um, you know, the, is, do, we, do we continue to think about the way we have blocked and stacked and the elements that we put in our buildings, or do we th can think about these, conceive them in a new way? So um, with that, I want to just open the floor and, 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 and let anyone who feels compelled to sing out and we'll uh, hopefully we'll be able to follow some threads from there. Do we have a brave volunteer? Nat grabbed his pen. I thought he was going for the microphone. <laughs> Victoria, maybe maybe why don't why don't I just open with an idea and and for those of us who have worked who are in the room who have worked on these embassies around the world. Um, Many of them, are, there, there are so many functions and things involved, but there is also something that I'm, I may say become, is static in terms of um, the, the standards of the workplace and, and at, at many levels. And so in a sense, what we've done is we've taken overseas to our embassies into the, all of these countries, um, the same workplace that you would see on, um, you know, in, in New York or in Washington, D.C., or, uh, and, and so maybe uh, a place is, and, and as Ambassador Moser said, this is a place when we're overseas to interact with the people there, to embrace what those cultures are, but then we also bring our own culture to it. So what could be different about the, the, the design and the planning of these spaces overseas. As we're thinking about things here, the, as the, 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 the library, the way that people are going to the coffee shops and working, the way that um, WeWorks and different places are working here, how do we take that to the embassies overseas and, um, and also through that be able to be more budget conscious without having a seat at every desk or a, a seat at, in every space? And so think this is our chance right now, right, to, to think more broadly. Um, so I invite anyone either that has worked on an embassy or might in the future to uh, you know, share ideas. But the way it was. <laughs> no. I think we have an incredible opportunity here. People are connecting in different ways. They're using technology in completely different ways. And I think one thing that we've really learned is the importance of coming together, that time together is really precious. 
And so how do we enable our spaces to be able to accommodate that with large groups like this and the ability to grow the group or shrink it down as the conversation continues to have great technology so that we really do connect however we need to connect globally. And look, those of us that have worked with global teams, we have figured out ways to connect using technology in a very personal way, even way pre-COVID it was necessary. But how do we really make that mainstream? And then what goes on in those spaces when we're together? That's the magic. That is the connections. That is the experiences. That is where we take care of each other. That's where we create, where we innovate, and where those, those um, points of magic happen as people come together. I think that's what's really important. And when we, when we, Ambassador Moser talked about our customers and putting our customers first, that is the most important thing. Table stakes is secure spaces that work operationally. But the magic that happens inside is when we really think about how do we put our customers first? What do they want to get done for themselves, for their jobs, for their families, for the future? And when we think about that, it's coming together and it's providing the services that create wonderful, hospitable, welcoming experiences for the associates, for the visitors, the minute they come into the space, until they leave. And that means inside and outside, using our outside spaces to create that wellness, those, those ability to connect using technology. Many, many, many wonderful opportunities here. And it may mean that we don't need as much square footage, but it's going to mean that we're gonna need more outdoor space. And it's going to mean that we wanna look at our spaces in a very, very different way experientially. Table stakes is having productive space. What, what we are able to enable with the services inside those spaces, that's gonna be the magic. I think that's pushing the frontier. It's hospitality, it's wellness, it's experiences, um, and it's how we come together and really create and innovate. I think that, we're talking about the new frontier, that's it. I see an opportunity uh, when you talk back to the legislature about this right with with GSA and OBO and the military they're all so caught up in the distinct breakdown of programmatic spaces the possibility to turn that around and make spaces do multiple things um, seems like it could be a win-win if you can get the legislative types to change their attitude about that because it, it is more efficient more effective um, in that regard, um, and then it also plays back to the point. Why do people want to be there? Either for the mission or for the space or both. Um, and those uh, tight fit programmatic spaces are never the best spaces to be in. It's always the more open and flexible um, spaces and uses. I guess building on the analogy with retail. Um, Many years ago, you'd go to a shop, and now when you shop, it's a verb. It's gone from a noun to a verb, and work has gone from a noun to a verb. And so thinking about that, you would design and consume the space differently. You would look at the amenities that you'd be providing. But what that also brings is this tremendous efficiency, because you can plan it differently uh, for those times throughout the day with this whole idea of work-life blur, looking at other amenities, such as fitness and all of those other things to accommodate, and potentially utilizing residences more like you're seeing with some of the tech companies where they're kind of they've got residential experience with the workplace and you've got the same situation we have with um, the embassies and consulates another very important thing to keep in mind when you look at this context is just the thought that um, gen z globally is going to be a third of the workforce by 2030 so that that is a very important aspect because when you look at some of the trends that are going on just in return to office and you keep telling you that there are these mandates come back back in the day when people had telephones they said they were tethered to their desk by their phone why can't I use my cell phone people now feel that they have to go back and they're tethered to the office as a surveillance tool to make sure they're working which is not right so thinking about the design context how to use technology how do you make it more experiential and how do you accommodate the way different people work when the question comes in, but why do we have to come back? What would I do differently here that I wouldn't do somewhere else? We use a lot of social media, we do other things. I live this way, why can't I work this way? So I think these are all thoughts we have to consider when we look at new workplaces and new uses and just the idea of sharing. I think too, and I wanted to 
uh, build upon Elizabeth's comment, uh, the opportunity for uh, utilizing site to respond to so many of these issues of uh, workplace uh, uh, quality and character. You have the potential to expand opportunities for creativity and problem solving beyond the desk. It does, you know, if you're using sitting desks, standing desks, running desks, clusters, individuals, you should be able to bring that outside and to be able to do it as well, particularly in a post-COVID environment where you're trying to infuse a flexibility for the workspace that responds to any, any variable of what that condition might be like. Um, it's not uh, limited to the building's interior. Um, and in particular, in the context of retention of young talent, this experiential quality uh, that Maureen is referencing is incredibly important. It's part of their lifestyle, um, the Instagram uh, 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 era of that. Um, and in particular, the notion of health and wellness and the way in which um, uh, the, the capacity for landscape can actually positively inform uh, productivity in that way and retention um, as well. It is the least expensive thing to manipulate to inform the greatest number of people. It's um, these performative landscapes that are about fortification, about climate crisis response, about um, recognizing um, the written landscape of democracy abroad um, is also um, part and parcel of the work experience um, and should be better occupied and given greater opportunity to reflect um, what is happening internally to that building. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, so during the, the roundtable that we had, we, we talked a lot about some of the larger macro trends affecting uh, real estate in general, commercial office space, usage of offices, uh, the really decrease in utilization and occupancies, and how there's really a flight from quantity to quantity. Uh, quality and we, we talked a lot about domestically within the United States uh, for the federal government uh, there's, a, there's a real opportunity to have that shift from quantity to quality because the government tends to pay an incredible amount of money to house an individual federal employee that the quality of that space is really quite low uh, because there is just so much excess quantity in the process which then puts a huge burden on the maintenance of and the O&M budgets of the agencies. And the federal government in general, and you, you described some of these problems earlier, uh, they tend to get money to build and then they starve you after that. You can't get a dime to operate or maintain afterwards. And so that quantity issue is really important because that really, the amount of your space drives your O&M budgets for decades afterwards. And so part of the discussion was, well, how much do these trends actually relate to OBO and how you all do your work? And we talked about the constraints of budget, but also security. And I would just suggest here in the, in the national capital region, DOD, Washington headquarters service, their footprint right now is, is being realigned quite significantly. They found during the pandemic, tremendous amount of secure work actually didn't have to happen. Or I should say, a tremendous amount of the work that the people that are involved in secure programs didn't actually have to happen in that secure location. And, they, and their footprint is being radically uh, changed here in the national headquarters, or the Washington headquarters service area as a result. And so I do wonder when it comes to overseas buildings and your operations, how much of that applies there? And is, what is the sort of the scope of the opportunity for that exchange of quantity for quality. And then we also talked about security and openness and the ability to interact. We had a, a small discussion about DHS here in, in DC, St. Elizabeth, that level five secure campus that's being built out. And one of the agencies, FEMA, originally was supposed to go onto that campus. And ultimately, they decided not to put it on the campus because in large disasters, they have to bring in so many outside actors to help coordinate a disaster and getting them onto a level five secure campus, incredibly difficult and operationally disruptive for everything. And those types of interactions that they need to have on a regular basis, bring them onto that secure campus, there's all sorts of issues with that. Uh, and, I, and I also wonder, so in terms of OBO and just the basic design of how you interact with your host countries, um, where's that opportunity to really engage and interact with them? without having to bring them all into your secure campus, which has a whole host of problems for doing that. And it probably just limits the interaction. 
And that's not a great thing for diplomacy. Go ahead, John. I think it's, it's incumbent on us to recall that U.S. embassies are not State Department alone facilities. We're a platform providing services, in some cases for the intelligence community, the Department of Justice, the FBI, the defense attaches. And even within the State Department, there are different sections that don't talk with each other and need to do different things. You've got consular that's totally different. And while there's been a radical change in the United States in terms of how people are working, I think I would make the observation that I think it's gonna be a much, much slower change in terms of our embassies. I think these other agencies that are tenants in our buildings are not going to want to be changing very much. I think that they're going to be a stick in the mud for many things, and while state may be able to open up spaces and do things more collaboratively, because much of our work is unclassified, some of it's classified, but a lot, and a lot, and our job is to get out face to face and do things, but I think it's, it's going to be a terribly difficult thing to realize overseas at, at our embassies when we recall that sometimes we're a minority tenant in our own building and there are many others that are operating in ways that I just don't think are necessarily going to be open to as much change as maybe state is. And a follow-up, I guess, Greg, is I mean, do you think the budget, I don't, I don't presume that the budget challenges that are affecting state are only going to affect state. So I'm, a fa I'm believing that Fish and Wildlife and EPA and Commerce are having gatherings somewhat like this where they're wringing their hands and they're saying, oh my God, what are we going to do? So I'm hoping, and maybe, that, maybe it's a little bit naive, but that we could show leadership. We could show stewardship and say, are you worried about cost? We have some ideas, and I think this is where maybe the concept of loss and the fear of loss comes in. Um, because when you say, oh, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to come back in, people say, I'm losing my ability to work from home. I'm losing my, you know, my, uh, you know, my ability to not have that commute. Instead of, we're gonna create spaces for you that are so incredible, that are going to improve your productivity. You're gonna wanna come in, and you're gonna wanna beat everyone else out to the, I don't know, whatever, for your community, whatever the most attractive space is, right? You're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna beat everybody else up to that because you're so energized by being in that space. And maybe that's too high an aspiration for the State Department. I, I don't know, feedback, Jonathan. Oh, I was gonna say, I, why not, right? Like, why not in this time? I think one of the other discussions we've been having is you know, about efficiency and standardization, but I think I'm always one that says, we can acknowledge the fact that the last few years have been a significant disruption, and like all of the mindsets, ethos, formulas that went into defining workplace, as we've said for the last 70 years, are now appropriately being questioned. And I think when we kind of strip down into an 11 word mission, and say, well, what are the things that we need to prioritize so that we can rethink our standards and reprioritize things to say diplomacy is, is the standard. Diplomacy is not a physical space. It's, not, it's, it's an idea, it's a concept, it's a vision. And I think we're now in that time that says, well, why not redefine what are the things that are essential to, for diplomacy? And the truth is everything else is gonna have to be stripped out. But it, at the same time, this is, there is no better time to say, now is the time to throw out the playbook and rewrite it and define what our standards should be for the next 50 years. I think what I tying some of what David said in, in the quantity and quality and what um, Jonathan said, I think one of the keys is that as we're talking about budget cuts and so on, it's intention. And I think that, or it's intention in terms of very often the very first thing that's cut is is the architecture. It's like, well, there's too many of this and too many of that, and it's just about the way the building looks. And to your point, you want to draw people into the building. So I think that what's really critical is building on, again, what David said is less, is that you can look at the landscape around the building now as just doubling the size of the building, basically, the effective footprint of the building, and therefore, can you reduce actual square foot of the interior building? I agree there are going to be people that are going to just say no. But the more that you can drive just pure square footage and program down effectively and give people more flexibility to get out and do things and look at the entire site, the more you have the opportunity to spend the same per square foot on an iconic building that works so that 
facades aren't failing three years in and doors still open and things work and the building performs and people want to be there, that's the key, I think, is that you can't do all of this and keep the same size. So how do you get a great building that's going to work at a lower cost? You reduce the square footage and you use more of the space more effectively, I think is one of the answers. I think Nat's touched on something, though, that's super important. Uh, the greatest suspicion in government is of design. And mm -hmm. in fact, when budgets are tight, the first thing people say is extra is design. And what we're talking about right now is a generational uh, paradigm shift where if the design doesn't hold quality, it doesn't hold the people's interest mm -hmm. to be there. And so there's a very interesting model that Novartis did, and they did this about 15 years ago. The senior vice president said, we have very inefficient buildings. Mm -hmm. They were the bar buildings that were done in the uh, 70s and 80s. And they had a floor that was identically sort of laid out with private offices and a few public areas. They brought in Seville Peach to do one side of one floor where the key boss wanted everybody to be much more open to open office, but with uh, enough dedicated one-to-one -one seats to conference areas of different scales and meeting areas and huddle rooms. Um, she did an extraordinarily <clears throat> beautiful design. Now, the group that didn't move didn't want to move. And for the longest time, there was a sense that we wanted all that space and we didn't want to touch it. Bit by bit, everybody on every other floor said that this pilot exercise, which was less expensive because it had less enclosed space, hence more efficient uh, mechanical areas, which cost the same as the other space down the way, became so compelling that it became the definitive model for all their future spaces. So what I wonder about is whether OBO could consider piloting a one-to-one -one double blind scenario test to see where people choose to vote with their feet. I love that, Marion. I mean, I, I think what I'm getting is, you know, somebody mentioned Gen Z, somebody mentioned, um, uh, they didn't say it in this way, but hybridizing programs for spatial efficiency. And the reality is um, the Gen Zs are antsy and no size fits all. So we could talk about this for days. No size will ever fit all again, ever, ever, ever. <laughs> and so I think the word is variety and clever um, combinations of ways to work. They're extroverts, they're introverts. There's a sunny day for your site. There's a lousy day where no one wants to go outside. And so I think it's about coming up with um, a super brilliant series of kits of parts for different locations that make sense for different working styles. And we could even debate this just for the way people work in the US. Some people want a door. Some people want their own desk always. But we're talking about the world. <laughs> so we don't know how these other cultures are working or how quickly they're changing. So I think it's really, it's really about trying to come up with your architects and designers and conversations of, of a variety way of working. And I think that, I think somebody hinted to this, combining amenities with workspace, combining food, combining not just, you know, something as specific as a big cafe, but things that are a little bit this and a little bit that, a little bit mini kitchen food space, a little bit of work, a little bit um, of a kind of space that's domesticated, that feels like you're working from home, but in fact it is not your home. And so I think it's those kinds of hybridized moments and experiences that are the future. So I was just going to say that I think if we really look what everybody's doing, it would be unfortunate if we didn't challenge this and change as much as we possibly could. But I do think besides flexibility, dynamic, if you just look where real estate's going, those are the words people want. And flight and quality. So I do think architecture is the easiest design to take out. It's absolutely the wrong short-term move. But we also have to see that to really get people to come to the office, there has to be a major social aspect to it. So that's the dot that we're not having is it's OK. We should encourage the socialization. We should encourage the intersections, the differences. But that social aspect is kind of not what we had so much in our office space before. So how do we? I think the pilot's a great idea. Why not? You have extra space, right? <laughs> yeah. I think we're at a point where you have to reboot. I mean, the pandemic just pushed ahead online shopping and remote work. It was coming, but it pushed it a decade ahead so quickly that it's still being digested. 
I mean, people still don't know what it's going to be like post-pandemic. Uh, we got an idea, and all of these ideas are terrific, variety and everything else, but it should absolutely be something that you should focus on here because, again, it's not only in the United States, but the world. What, is, what does the world need? What model could you use? Pilot, pilot would be great. And, and I think the key to really lean on here, and we're touching it, but flexibility. You know, at the end of the day, within these footprints, you know, layering, layering in flexibility, you know, you've got the functional aspect of the office space, being able to move stuff around so that you can host parties and you can do gatherings and all hands on deck, you know, and, and that's really the key because, you know, to, to Beth's point, you know, things are continuing to evolve and people and the new generation, it, you know, there's no one size fits all. I, Oh, yeah. Uh, just uh, uh, building on that point, uh, there are models, I think, for flexibility that we're all familiar with, um, with businesses that have to use their space to attract people, like WeWork, uh, or Ace Hotel, which decided instead of just having a, a lobby, they'd have a, a lounge. So people would come there, right? Or it's the kind of thing that... Uh, uh, in other institutions and other agencies, we see um, the mixture of uh, dedicated audiences with restaurants and cafes that open up so that there's a mixing uh, between different kinds of people. Um, but I think the point about there being a fundamental change, and we don't have the answers, and we don't understand really how public space works in our own culture well enough, and so the issue is quite complex and has to do with, as you suggested earlier, it's listening and it's eyes on the ground and seeing what works. You know, landscape architects have been doing this for years with desire lines. Instead of deciding which paths are going to be taken, you put the buildings up and then just see how people naturally circulate and those become the paths and as those paths change, you follow and change those paths. And so in some way, um, it seems to go counter to a kind of rational planning mode. But there is, and going back to Marion's idea of doing a pilot, there is this way in which you have to test certain assumptions and see how they work out in the field. Um, I do want to caution a little bit about saying simply flexible, which, you know, I think we were also speaking about in terms of there is a sort of intrinsic or intuitive desire to sit in a well-designed space, but um, saying simply flexible for me evokes like an image of a white box, which is the definition of uninspiring and not going to draw somebody in. So it's also expensive and it's time consuming to reconfigure and brings with it a host of other problems that um, will actually work against bringing people in. So if amenities and the initial draws of creating something that's perhaps nicer to sit in, um, we also need to think about the longer term draws. So I think that even if things that bring people in initially are things like needing to work in a larger group, perhaps it's technology needs, perhaps it's working with large format, you know, speaking from my own industry of architecture, right, when we have large format things or material samples, this was a huge problem during COVID, so that was what brought a lot of people back initially. But what keeps people there is actually the things that happen by accident. So whether it's the mood that you're in, David, from, you know, some of the amenity spaces on the exterior. Um, for us, what we've realized is that a lot of it too is an accidental encounter or an accidental learning. And a lot of this also speaks to younger staff and younger generations where when you're working remote, every interaction you have and every meeting you have is incredibly intentional. And when you are not remote and you're in a shared physical space with somebody, primarily not with walls, primarily that is more open and more um, inviting in terms of how you may or may not use it, 
you have a lot of accidental encounters, you have a lot of accidental overhearing of conversations, how somebody may or may not be handling a relationship, a meeting, um, a contract, and there is uh, a process that takes place where people realize they become better employees, better at their job, better team players, um, better participants in the culture of the workplace when you are sort of in these accidental encounters versus a very intentional Zoom meeting or Google chat. I would, I wanna just, and I appreciate that comment a lot. I was also thinking more macro flexibility this morning. We talked about risk mitigation on construction and delays and schedule. And Greg and I were talking at lunch, like, you know, there, there could be a discussion and a pilot or, or a way to think about the building past a certain size that gets built sort of in one contained functional uh, part of the embassy that can go up in a few years and get occupied and then you're building around it with other phases. And you could also see in the future if people don't end up moving in or there's another pandemic or something, the ability to effectively close down parts of the site without it feeling empty. Because I think one of the biggest issues is you have an empty floor in the middle and it feels like you just don't want to go to the next part of the building because you're going through an empty area. So do you design buildings more around these sort of, you know, outward shells or floors? We, you know, it's funny is in, in urban areas in New York City, Frank, Dan, I, we do these buildings all the time on 40 foot sites with constraints all around. So the idea that you couldn't build around an occupied area effectively, I think is a fallacy. I think you could put up an embassy and a consulate and function and then keep building behind and around um, at this. I know there's security and so on, but I do think there's an opportunity there and then to think about how you would close that down potentially uh, at different times without losing the buzz and the energy in a smaller space. I think the great thing about this conversation is we don't have to know the answer the first day because we are not designing for point in time. And so a really careful analysis of space where you look at what is permanent, what's the 80% that can be flexible and what does flexibility mean so it doesn't become a white box um, is really important so that over time you can alter the ratios between settings, add new settings, increase or decrease variety. This is not an impossible thing. We are learning how to do this. And there will be a much different program than what I've experienced at least here because OBO's program is so different and their mission is so different, but there is a version of this. I, I believe that that could Im be employed. So the idea of a pilot, I think, is really wonderful because you'll be able to come up with um, a, a thesis tested, but even if it's wrong, you know, we'll be able to change that. And this, and you know, the things that we should do is that change should not be expensive. It should be inherent in the building. Now, one thing I will say, is interiors need to drive the building a lot more than they currently do. They need to be influenced the shape, the form, the function of that building. So how many presentations have I seen where we see all the stuff on the outside, even more site work, David, than we see interiors? And it's like the interiors had nothing to do with the design of the building when they are everything uh, in terms of what people are doing day to day with the site. So it just seems funny that we, we sometimes miss the importance of site and we certainly miss the importance of interior. And now is a time I think you can do this pilot and you can employ the best thinking. And it's not, this is what we always say at our company, ultimate flexibility is expensive and it is not worth it. Carefully thought with focal points and what is permanent and what is program that is too special to be moving around and then what's the 80% that we can have this great uh, play and flex with. Yeah. Well, no, 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 because the 80-20 the rule uh, applies here. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. You know, companies will make 80% of their profits on 20% of their products. You know, where's the sweet 20%? You know, you, you got less is more in architecture. I think we have less is more in a different way now. Um, and that really should be focused on. I mean, what, what's important to OBO in terms of the mission? You touched on this earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, and I wouldn't be surprised if you find that 20% of what you do drives 
80 percent of, of, of your success you know so it, it really is an interesting time to to visit this um let me just uh, put a simple criteria on the table that i think state may want to think about so there's the inside there's the outside and there's the wall between and the wall certainly is permanent um and i can tell you myself and most people i know react positively to daylight and fresh air um, but your buildings are pretty tight um, because of security um, and it may be that loosening some of that, some evaluation of that as it relates to opening a perimeter of a building would be helpful too. If I may. So, so one thing I keep hearing also from uh, this morning discussion, you know, we have, this is a great group of people. I think in the audience, I think we have a mix of architect, mechanical engineer, landscape, structural engineer, operation, maintenance, construction, et cetera. You know, one thing I think we keep talking, you know, we just mentioned we need to design for interior. In interior need to be, the team need to be in the design phase. We heard we need to design for the landscape. We need to design for maintenance. We need to design for operation, right? So one thing I think we need to keep thinking is what's the upfront cost versus the life cycle cost? I think this is exactly true for, especially for OBO buildings, because you guys own that for almost forever, right? So, I think in the consideration, you know, if you look, not only look upfront cost, but look at the life cycle cost, because when you design for better structure, you will save potential repair cost. When you design for better energy code, you will save for the energy efficiency. When you design for other things, there's other savings, right? Look at the life cycle cost. But in general, I think in our profession, there's one issue I think uh, I kind of observe is like, if you think about, you know, the structure design is governed by ASE by the I, I code. If you look, think about the architect by AIA, if you think about the interior, there's, I'm sure there's its own criteria, mechanical, actually, I mean, there's all different criteria. One of the challenges like, you know, when we design for the system, the same building, the system is supposed to support the people who live, work inside there, but sometimes those different professions not, are not talking to each other. They're, on, they're all designed for their, their best practice. So I think if, if we can create a poly study, I like the poly study, study idea. If we can create a process in a platform, seeing you know, how we can make these teams, all different design professions work together in the very beginning. You know, look at the different options, but also look at the life cycle cost, not only at the upfront cost. I think that'd be, that'd be fantastic in a way. But it's, again, I think this is the common theme, you need the interdisciplinary collaboration, but not the design. Before it's designed for structural design for architecture, it's like everyone kind of do their own thing, following, following their own code. If we can have that collaboration, we design for the system, same system, serve the same people. I think different professions need to talk to each other. So, JQ, I guess when you were talking, I, I immediately thought, is it possible that we reach out to our appropriators, our authorizers, and say, Yes, we can reduce costs 10%. And it's not going to be on construction. It's going to be in O&M. And that's where, I mean, maybe that, maybe we have, I mean, I don't know. Dan, you're, you're smiling because you're like, would you, would you buy that if you were up there? If you were still up there, would you, uh, what would you say about that? No, Congress doesn't think beyond a budget cycle. It can't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, we, know, tried, I just, we tried for years to create a two-year budget cycle, actually, at the federal government. Texas has a two-year budget cycle, um, and there's some real advantages to it. Uh, dead on arrival. Because I love, I love the idea of pilot. I thought, ah, oh, it's great. And I'm like, who goes where and says, oh, by the way, I don't know what the requirement is. I don't have a, I don't have a space requirements program. I don't know which my agencies are. I don't know how to recoup capital security cost sharing and you know from those agencies but I'm convinced this is really we're at this pivotal moment in time so I need you to allow me to use some of my two billion of appropriated funds which are really supposed to be going to provide safe secure functional resilient facilities to move people out of harm's way so that I can do this thing because if I don't I'm going to be way I mean I'm going to be even further behind than I already am so I mean how, where yeah go ahead Maureen could you 
possibly look at one of the new embassies that are going up and saying that so for core mission, not the tenants that will want their, you know, their square footage and their very traditional build out, that you program it to ask what types of work do they do, the kind of the journey of work throughout the day, what is that variability that they'd like. Um, Unispace did a study just recently and they released it and they surveyed over 7,000 people globally about why they like working remotely, for example, why they like hybrid work. And some of it just had to do, believe it or not, they said the employees, what they hated about coming back to the office, they hated losing the privacy of working from home. It was personal privacy because they feel like so jammed, like everyone's kind of in their face. And so that was a really big thing. They, I think people got too close, like 75 square foot a person and they're on top of each other. They didn't like that. Uh, they feel more effective in a quiet remote space. So you start looking at the parallel, like more privacy. And then also people feel more productive at home. I think some of it has to do with commute. The employers were saying the reason they thought they wanted to stay home was they were f afraid they were going to lose all the extra time they have by not commuting because they're doing a lot of um, uh, homework, like work around the house, and they're gonna, which is totally wrong, right? But that was the voice of some of the employers that were against it. But if you could program it with um, authenticity, really listening, and understanding what it, those stakeholders would say, we're willing to do this with you, um, here's what we need from you, it would probably be less square footage. You might have to inv invest more to make it really exciting. And then the other people who have the big square footage, it could be a lot more vanilla, and that could be your pilot like comparing one use case against the other. See, they're looking over going, that's actually amazing. Can I use it? Actually, no, you guys chose that. Maybe you can use a little bit, and maybe it happens that way organically. I think that's really smart. Just the next project out of the gate is the pilot, kind of, sort of. Depends on the project. But I want to say something about, I believe everything you just read that you've found in, the, in your, in your uh, research on how people are um, framing going back to work. I will say this, we did just fine pre-pandemic working together. We are missing that social energy. And I don't know about you guys, but you remember the first party you went to after the pandemic broke and everyone was like, hey, you know, people weren't used to being together. So people are not used to working together again. And I just want to make a distinction between variety and flexibility. I agree, I don't want a white box. I'm talking about hyper-specific design, you know, and theory is awesome, that can do many things at once, right? So it's an engaging uh, environment, whatever it is, and you can work this way, you can work that way. It's a high table, it's a low table, it's a sofa, it's a nook, it's big, it's tall, it's short, it's all of those things so that the people that work there have a choice. <laughs> and it's that, I say that it's that simple, it's not so simple, but I, I personally have been invested in this kind of workspace for many years now in my own practice. Um, so I feel very passionate about it. And, and the, there are always going to be closed door offices. Sometimes you need to close a door, like it doesn't matter what kind of person you are. Um, anyway, so I think the next project out of the gate at OBO, if it, happens to work is hopefully big enough that you can have a little bit of this and a little bit of that and that there's your pilot I just wanted to, I love the concept of the of trying to build something that is more flexible you know and I like this idea but one of the barriers that I have to be careful about when I manage this uh, portfolio is that Congress has said to us very clearly if people can work remotely, they don't need to. Uh, they don't need an office. Then they don't get a space. In other words, they don't need to be overseas. And this is something that I tried to remind people whenever the pandemic was going on, when I was assigned to Kazakhstan. You know, I know all of you love working remotely now. It's great. But if you're going to work remotely, Congress is going to say is you have no reason to be overseas. So I have to find. Uh, the really, uh, we have to be able to make this balance to say is, yes, this person is still doing the contact work that is so essential to the job. Uh, 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 and so uh, uh, I like the flexible idea because the flexible idea says, let's try to see if productivity increases if they're in a better, if the, the space is different. And I think that's what you're saying. Uh, but I, I do have to be cognizant of this, uh, this underlying uh, uh, really sentiment, and it's more than sentiment, it's actually an instruction from the Hill that we're not going to build spaces for people that aren't there. And, and I love the fact that you use the word productivity because how do you measure productivity in diplomacy, in diplomatic work? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, we actually do. Uh, we actually do, Victoria. In, in some ways, is that you know foreign service officers are competitively judged, and you can tell who's working and who's not by just reading their evaluations. And most of the time, the ones that are the most successful are the ones that you can tell are out working with their host governments. It's. There we go. Because I just want to, I want to maybe push back a little bit at the risk of my job. But uh, in any event, <laughs> I, no, the, the point being, I can see, I, I can see an argument where you need to be in country, but you don't need to be in building, right? There's a distinction, right? And, and that, that doesn't mean you're a remote worker. That doesn't mean you're a remote worker. That means you have a, a number of different spaces that you can choose to use based on what you need to be productive with the type of work you are doing that day, that time, that week, that month, whatever. So, I, so I, would, I would just say that I don't think that just because you are not in a building in the seat that has your Q123-1, you know, it's econ and you're you know, the second econ officer to the, you know, you know I, I'm, I'm poking a little bit of fun at our sort of signage. But yeah, go ahead, Dan. Uh, yeah, I guess I would just say there's a couple different issues here, right? One is, is the is the budget we talked all morning about the budget constraints very finite constraints things you have to deal with um, if you have work that doesn't need to be in country well then it probably shouldn't be happening in country and that may allow you to have a smaller footprint which is really what drives your cost both initial and long term and i think what uh victoria was saying about well you know maybe that in country employee doesn't necessarily need to be sitting in the office all the time every day. I mean, that's really true. You just think about a lot of federal law enforcement. Well, they have a certain part of their, their job they need to be sitting in their office, but they also have a large portion of their job where they need to be out in the field, so to speak. And just kind of the design changes, that whole quantity for quality exchange, that the potential there. Um, you know, if, if every Every one of those law enforcement officers had to have their own private office because that's where they brought in their uh, different people to interview. Well, it was simply a design a solution to have kind of common interview rooms, common private offices. So when they were in, they had a private place to work. But that didn't mean everybody had to have a private place. And therefore, the footprint could get considerably smaller. The quality of space went through the roof. The total cost was less. It was a truly win-win, and, and maybe that's where there's opportunity for OBO. And Dan, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that where we will end up, I think on a lot of this, or at least in, in this uh, discussion, is to really look at how much, uh, there is a figure that we need of this, how much office space do you actually have? The law, uh, I have visited a couple of the posts overseas that are law enforcement heavy. They're very rarely in the offices. Uh, and it is true, there is some savings, and Victoria, you know one of the posts I'm thinking about for this, that's almost an entirely law enforcement platform, that we actually need to think for that is that it, is going, it should be some kind of a hoteling arrangement uh, in a future configuration uh, that, uh, that really suits that need but, but, and has the interview rooms, but it needs to be something that really looks at space as a premium and really tailors it to the amount of space they really need because it is true for them. But there are other elements of our missions that aren't like that. And you know, and this is actually when we do space requirements programs, I think this is, gets down to a much, a much more uh, a, a careful examination about how that's conducted. Uh, but I think that we see, you know, GSA standard is now 1.7 people uh, uh, for a desk. I wonder where you get the other, <laughs> you get a 0.7 person, but that's another uh, uh, issue. Uh, but uh, it's something that I'm actually, that, that I actually want us to talk about and consider. And I, and I oh, sorry, go ahead, Chelsea. I just want to riff, if I could, just on something, that 1.7. And yet we, we evaluate the buildings we design overseas one for one on desks. That's actually a metric by which we measure whether we were successful. Now the size of the desk can change. We can tight size, we can do other things, but we do a metric of a successful design is one for one. 
And so I think what I'm hearing here are some opportunities to kind of rethink some of that. Um, I also want to say, although I think a lot of this group doesn't um, see this element of, of our work, but I think this pilot might work in one of our space renovations. So not so much, I mean, there's an opportunity mm -hmm. to express this in a space renovation or a major space renovation, even when we have to go into the, into the HVAC systems and, and resize them uh, for the number of, of staff that we want to support at a mission. Um, it may can also happen in one of the next designed um, full builds, but I, I'm seeing like some, maybe some near-term opportunities for it. So I was kind of inspired by this. So um, yes. I've taken copious notes. <laughs> I love that idea, and I was also listening to a couple of folks talking about shared types of spaces, and I think, Rick, we might have talked about this in, in another context, C CAA, you know, are we, are we effectively utilizing, um, you know, ratios of CAA, um, also interview space, when you want to bring somebody in from outside, you know, do we need to create interview space behind the hard line? Uh, or can we do something more clever? So I don't, I don't know if you already have thoughts about both of those, but I thought I'd give you the floor. Yeah, thanks. I've been kind of purposely quiet just to listen. Uh, <laughs> space standards kind of fall under my group here. Uh, Laura Rogers does a great job, as we all know, Laura. But uh, um, two things. One, CA, classified space. Yeah, we have been talking with uh, some of our, our agencies that work in those spaces and how we might be able to uh, reduce some of that space. Um, some of it's kind of historical, some of it just, you know, bigger workstations that they may or may not need. Uh, obviously, we have some uh, security components that drive a lot of that that we just can't go around, as, as Greg mentioned. Uh, some of it is just kind of a must-have to an extent. Um, but, but we're talking to see what we can do to reduce that. We think there's probably some that could probably, uh, a desk in the unclassified area, and that's more of a touchdown space type of thing for, for, the, for the small amount of classified works. Not all of them do classified all the time. Um, another thing we haven't really talked about here is, 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 is a great discussion and, and a lot to think about. A lot of it is going to be just kind of where industry kind of goes to an extent. Um, it's a big old world out there. We talk a lot about what happens here in the States and Gen Z here in the States. Well, Gen Z here in the States is probably a whole lot different than that in Nigeria or Tokyo or Australia, you know, wherever else we're at, right? And so we got a lot of cultural norms. A whole lot of our desk space are for local employees. Not Americans. Most of them. Most of them. Most are, of them right? Are and so how is that local culture going to affect if we give them the squishy beanbag chair that we might want, right? <laughs> so uh, just something to think about as we go, and then it gets very difficult if we're, we want to standardize as much as we can, which is a great thing. We've got to optimize where we can, and optimizing for space is something we need to look to do, and it's just a big challenge because it's just potentially different in different countries, right? So yet one more thing to think about. And let's not forget someone touched on AI this morning. Uh, it will be eliminating jobs. These buildings are going to take five to ten years to build. By the time some of them are built, there will be less jobs. I mean, that is what is definitely predicted. So I think that should be taken into consideration when we talk about space planning. Mm. So where do we start? If, if part of this, I'm going to, my other theory is that there's a culture change piece. And, you know, and all it takes, bring your group of tenants in, and all it takes is one tenant to say, well, no, I really, I really need mine exactly. I really need one seat per person. I, I really need it just this way. I'm willing to pay for it. I want it just this way. Right, and then, you know, Tracy says, yep, mm -hmm, I need mine too. And then Geralee says, yep, I need mine too. And then you, and then you lose that, right? It's the, it's the reverse of the domino, or you know, it's a negative domino effect, right? Everyone says, well, if you're not going to change, I'm not going to change, right? So, how do we find, how do we find the, the leaders? How do we find the, what is it, the, um, the ones who want to, the early adopters? How do we find that? How do we find where, where do we look? How do we spot one? Where is your expertise about? where the sort of soft underbelly is that we might push on to sort of say, okay, if we can get you, then we could get two more, and how do we, how do, we do that? Um, so, so I'd like to, what Victoria said, and also what Rick mentioned, and I think that when we see the images on the, on the board of these beautiful architectural pieces with the site, and now we're spending an hour talking about workplace which is really the essence of what these are and, and the, the offices. And, and, and honestly, I, I do have to say, OBO, kudos, because the interior group, what, what has happened already in terms of 
the flexibility of the workspaces and, and doing mock-ups of different kinds of workspaces and kind of pushing it. It's pushed, I think, m further than many other um, government organizations, actually, at OBO, because what's happened is the same rigor for the interiors ha has happened at OBO that has happened for the mechanical systems and the structural systems and the security systems. And so one thing that I would say to to the architects working on these projects is to think inside out and constantly think in, inside out. And I think that the most successful new projects are the ones that are also thinking about those spaces. And 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 even with, with the standards now, which is so different than it's not big walled cubicles anymore. It's open, it's flexible, it's smaller workspaces. And what's happened now is in the new programs, this is what you get. This is the way it is. And then you have so, so some of it is to just say this is what you get rather than say, um, you know, uh, allow, allow you to, to learn about flexibility through actually using it like um, Marianne was saying that, that they weren't going to change to that new model until they s actually saw it. Once they did, they said, wow, this is a lot better than working in these big high cubicles where I'm just can't even see the light of the day. So um, I think that even with what we're talking about, OBO's made a lot of good progress in that, and and with the architects working with either their own interiors teams or space planning interiors teams or um, consultant teams to do this from the inside out, I I think is a really big step. Thank you. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab the microphone because I think it really comes full circle here. You, uh, the ambassador started talking about the essence of diplomacy is to have a dialogue and that diplomacy is a contact sport or environment. I wasn't sure. It's a sport. I'm, I'm, I will go with sport. Um, but that, that's what's going to drive the ability to be able to change these groups that don't want to give up their spots and want to be all secured. There are going to be certain groups that just have to, but it's not, you know, out of 80, it's going to be two. And having that real dialogue conversation, um, you know, with, with my teams, um, I, I look at, we talked about training earlier today and the kind of training that my teams need. And actually a lot of them need storytelling skills and influencing skills. And then they can start the dialogue, they can start the diplomacy, and they can start to influence change in that way. I think that's really, really exciting. You know, you started out with the vision um, and the mission of the customer as the client. What are their hot buttons? Find out what their hot buttons specifically are, deliver those, and then use diplomacy to get rid of the rest of it. That's how you get them going. Well, I can't think of a better way to conclude the session. So thank you very much for that, Suzanne. I know we're going to move to uh, at 2.55, so I would encourage everybody to maybe stand in place, stretch a little, like do a little shimmy shake or something, shake the cobwebs out, and then we'll ask the panel to move up to the dais.
The, U, the U.S. disaster liabil liability, you know, have the cost of the, U, the nation about $120 billion per year. If put on scale, that's about 8% of our construction GDP. That's a lot. It increases about 6% per year, and that's about 10 times our population growth, or two times our GDP gro growth. So besides the measurable physical damage in our lives, et cetera, natural disasters does interrupt our lives, right? Cause a lot of human suffering, uh, suffering, something that is not quantifiable yet. So on the screen is a study led by Dr. Laurie Peake from Natural Hazard Center. Her team tra uh, track, uh, traced the families that was affected by the Hurricane Katrina. If you see some of those bullet points there, it's heartbreaking moved 12 times in seven years, lose two plus years of school, lose a lot of critical resources, housing, culture support, etc. It's really a tragedy, right? So the good news, also um, the natural disaster is not a US alone problem. Probably you all well know this is a global issue. In fact, it's probably the worst in other parts of the world than US. US has more uh, stringent construction regulations uh, to help to protect our built environment. So if this year alone, that's the past few months, right? Libya, Morocco, Turkey, Syria, earthquakes. All those global disasters, it's kind of tragedy. If you think about the number of people, the, the lives it took, thousands, tens of thousands. So this is a, a heat map, shows all the risks of the Department of State's 294 posts across the world. So you can see most of the posts are exposed to some kind of natural disaster. Extreme heat, wind, flood, 
tsunami, earthquake. Some are at a very high risk. So this is a real threat, it's a really urgent issue. So the good news is we do have solutions or options. So a fun fact here, so my word choice when I prepared the slides, I said we have options. Then my colleague, my neighbor's colleague told me, no, you, you need a stronger word. I think you should say we have solutions. So I'm still undecided, that's the reason I said solutions slash options. So I want to hear your opinion at the end of my talk to say, you know, what do you think? So today I'm going to talk about the building code, mitigation, then community resilience. That's the theme for my, um, for my talk. So let me start this story. So this, is, this red roofed house in Hawaii went viral, went viral in the past few weeks, at least in my world. So I wrote an op-ed article on this, um, on this uh, red roof uh, structure housing with uh, my colleague from IBHS, uh, Ann Kopf, uh, who is the chief engineer for the, for the organization. Basically, we've seen how the miracle home survived in the Maui fire. Right? In fact, this, the, ho the homeowner did two things. First one, he has a metal roof. Second thing, he cut down the foliage around the house, around the house for termite control. And magically, it saved, it saved the house. If you look around, all the house is gone. In fact, there's more, even more successful, successful, successful story in the neighborhood south of the Kahoma stream. In that neighborhood, no single family house is lost. They only lose a few multi-family house. It's really, it work, 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 works out great. In that neighborhood, what they do, they have the uncombustible, the cleaning material, less construction fuels between structures. They have some high wind off ridge vent. So the thing I'm trying to draw here is from engineer point of view, all these things the homeowners down, have down here is linked to the recommendations under the International Wildland Urban Interface Building Code, the OE code. So in the OE code, to, mit to mitigate the wildfire fire threat to our house, five recommendations, right? First one, on combustible roof, defense space, then reduce the fuels, or water supply, and so on. The point I'm trying to make here is the building code does work. Even the homeowner didn't do that on purpose for thermal control, he cut down the foliage, but it works. If you want to go one step further, go beyond the minimum code requirements. There's called a wildfire prepared home that was developed by the Institute for Business and Home, uh, home Safety. So there are simple things you can do on the cleaning materials for our architect, architect friends. There is defending space for our uh, landscape colleagues here, right? So many of those things nowadays is really a collaboration across the different professions to protect our built environment. There are most successful stories about the building, building code works. So this is another example. So uh, you know, early this year, there was a big earthquake in Turkey, Syria. So U.S. sent a lot of teams over there for reconnaissance to see what lessons learned. This is very, is very uh, encouraging. If you see all the things happen there due to the construction quality, et cetera, but this one is very encouraging, right? There's a city hospital. It's kept, it's kept operation during the first shock. It only paused operation for one day. It served for 300 patients. In the near neighborhood, all the houses have been devastated, but this hospital worked. And more and more, in my profession again, FEMA has done many of these studies. They send teams after major disaster. They will evaluate what has worked, what hasn't worked. It's called MAT team. So this is the one uh, they evaluate for the Hurricane Katrina, right? the summary report for the building performance. There are many, many successful stories seeing that there's a flood elevation for the base ele elevation, telling you the building code works against wind, seismic, wildfire, flood, all the natural disasters. So my message here today is the building code works. So for those of you who, don't, who are not very, very familiar with the building code, so building code often refers to the I code, is the internal, is a code, is a serious code uh, published by the International Code Council. Those establish the minimum 
uh, for example, the minimum requirements that is necessary to provide building safety for the public. There are many studies show that the building code would better protect our structure against natural disasters. So does that mean we have a solution? No. So there's a surprising fact, you know, even I'm in this area, I'm so surprised to find this out. In the US, only about two thirds, not only, about two thirds of all the jurisdictions across the US hasn't adopted the latest code. And many places in the US don't have any code. That's very surprising, right? This, that's, that's the, also shocking to me when I first saw the data when the FEMA ICC do the, do the survey, survey. So one of the reasons for that, there are many different reasons, technical challenge, but one of the main reasons is the cost, right? Cost affordability. When you follow, follow the code, sometimes it will increase the cost a little bit. So the question often comes up, does this make economic sense? Benefit versus cost. So um, at the NIPS, we conduct a study called the benefit, Natural Hazard Mitigation Saves. Then we do the benefit cost analysis. Okay, let me give you a very quick run through how we do the, do the study. So we look at building set, right? All the characters of the building. Then we look at the, we look the hazard that the building is, is uh, exposed to. Either it's wind, seismic, or different hazard the risk. Then we run the probabilistic analysis to see what's the potential loss with all the information. So we do the loss estimate based on without mitigation, then with mitigation. The difference is the benefits. Then divided by the cost, that's your benefit cost ratio. You can call this, um, you can call this uh, investment return, right? So that's the very high level uh, uh, run through how we do, do this. So what do we found? So we found, you know, for every dollar we spend, in mitigation to be more prepared, we will save the society $6 in return. That's like President Biden cited, cited our study. Um, so this study, in fact, started by in 2005. This study, in fact, is re requested by Congress. Back then, the Congress asking FEMA, you know, for all the money FEMA spending on the disaster mitigation for preparedness, is that good investment? Is that a good way to spend our taxpayers' money? Right? Back then, we found it's one to four. Then a few years ago, we did a more comprehensive study. You can see the serious report we published. Uh, this is funded by FEMA, HUD, EPA, and a few, a few private sectors. It's, it's one of the most comp comprehensive studies. So what we found, oh, the picture is covering my numbers, but I can tell you, so we looked at different, few different options. For the federal grants, for the money, the federal government spent by FEMA, by HUD, by EPA is one to six. That's where the President Biden cited that number. For adopting code is one to 11. From 1990 errors code to current code, one to 11. Building code is really the first our defense line. But when you do beyond code, I can be reminding you, code is the minimum requirement for life safety. When you do beyond code is one to four. When you do retrofit for the existing buildings, that's also so four to one. Every dollar you spend, you'll save four dollars. We also looked at a few key studies for life lines, for water, with water, transportation, is four to one. So this is a very, is a thousand page report. We try to summarize some of the key findings in, the, in one table. Uh, I offer the link there, you feel free to check this out. So the question comes back again. Building code works, mitigation saves, make, make economic sense. Do we solve the problem? comes down to the decision making. Is what the building owners, what they will ask. Do they ask, do they ask the que right questions? Do they know what options do they have when they construct a new building or retrofit? So here is a, a great demonstration by our colleague, Ron Hamburger. So it shows the different performance stage for the building. The first one is totally collapsed. I'm sure no one wants that. Second one, you can see the building is severely damaged, but it doesn't collapse. That really will try to avoid kills people and minimize the injury. But I, I, probably want to, I don't want to go back in, into that building anytime soon, unless it's cleared or repaired. Third one is you can reoccupy, 
but probably you don't have too much service. No water, electricity, you can temporarily as a shelter. For the one, fourth one, we call functional recovery. You can have some re reoccupy, you can perform some basic function, not full function. The, fourth, the fifth one is uh, full function. So for our current code, if you guys know, our current code is on second phase. That's our design philosophy. We design for life safety. That's what I code is based on, right? It's a great balance between public safety with affordability, cost, cost, uh, cost uh, on the cost side. So I want to share with you uh, some new development in the industry. This ongoing development on the fourth phase, I call the functional recovery. So for that one, let me give you some quick, quick background. So for the functional recovery, there are a lot of conversations in the industry in the past 45 years. So I list many different resources. Some is by White House, some is by the Congress, some is by the local government, some, some is by the industry group. But the one thing I want to highlight is this one, the 2018 the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Act. So in that act, the Congress clearly, clearly spelled out so this is the code from that, that, uh, that act. They want to say, they want to increase the resilience of communities. They want to go beyond life safety because all the, all the cost doesn't make sense. If you just like try to minimize the life safety, then all the costs we spend, $120 billion every year, that's too much. They want to increase the community resilience. So that triggers a lot of discussion in the industry, especially for design construction. Because what does community resilience mean? And what does it mean to, for our profession, how we design, how we construct our buildings, right? So there's definition on the community resilience that's in the law, that's the Congress defined that, has the ability to prepare and plan for, absorb, recover from, uh, most of, uh, adapt to the adverse uh, seismic effect. The National Academy have a similar definition for community resilience. What does that mean to our profession, for our design construction? So one of the recommendations from the building industry is we want to design, construct, retrofit individual buildings for functional recovery, not only for life safety. That means after a major event, people can get back to the building in the days, weeks, or months. We want to define that. So I'm highlighting here, so this is an ongoing effort. The fourth figure, that's the functional recovery, that's the ongoing effort. Uh, let me share some of the timeline. So for the functional recovery code, it's happening. So uh, the beginning size of the safety council at the NAPES, and that's the one I manage. So this is the one of the councils support the agency, support the NEHOP Act, transfer the findings into the code standard. So we are actually working on the functional rec recovery code for seismic for new buildings because the charge by the, the, by the New Herb Act. So the expectation is we will have most work done, the design provision will most done next year, 2025. We expect this will be adopted by ASC 728. 28 means 2028. On a voluntary basis. Because this is a very significant shift from life safety to functional recovery. We don't think the in terms of the, the community will be ready for that. There'll be too many pushback. But we, we think we want to get there um, ready to use. So this is expected to be adopted by the ASC 2028. 20, Next, we hope this will be adopted by the I code 2030. We hope this will be adopted by the forward-thinking building owners. We hope this will be adopted by the federal agencies, lead by example. Uh, this is standard. But to make it nationwide for such a big change, I don't think the nationwide is not ready yet. That's the, we're looking 10 years down the road, but that's normally how the building code standards are developed. But the actual provision will be ready later ne next year. Right? So that's my question. Like, does building owners know their options? Do they ask the right question? What's my performance objectives or goals for my building? Life safety, functional recovery? What do I expect? Then how do this connect to the communities? Right? If you think about building, if your building needs to function, besides the structure, besides the non-structure, besides HVAC, everything else, you need the water, you need the road, 
you need telecommunication in the, in the electricity. All right? So this really ties back to you from an individual building to the community con concept. Then when you look at the community, each of the lifeline sectors is interdependency. Right? When you try to re uh, restore the electricity, you need to open the road. When you try to open the road, you need fuel. When you, th when you need to try to restore the fuel supply, you, you need electricity. So the interconnected, there's a lot of interdependency. Here's another grid picture, very complicated, complex. That's in the report by FEMA and NIST Bank of the Congress. Talking about the inter interdependency between different lifeline sectors. Right? So I think the, the question is, if you use seismic, you use individual building fund fund recovery as a starting point, how we can collaborate with all the different lifeline sectors? Like I mentioned earlier, how we can design for the same performance goals? Uh, if you look at the society, which utility need to bank function at the what time frame so you can support each other? We don't need every single building bank to function within days or within weeks, only the critical infrastructure. Right? I think Ambassador Moose this morning mentioned for some of those posts, it's like a small community. You have a compound, you have housing, you have water, you have, you have power. Right? It's one community. But, it, but if you look how those design nowadays, everyone follows their best practice in that sector. They're not necessarily coordinated. So there's a big gap caught out by this report. We need a national lifeline, lifeline organization. We need to collaborate, we need to talk to each other. So um, future directions gap, the current state, life safety, what's happening now, functional recovery is happening. Even if it's not mandatory, but it's happening. It will be ready there in a year or so for the forward-thinking building owners. For the future, how we can expand the functional recovery for seismic to motor hazard, to wind, uh, wildfire, flood, right? That's a world time champion, world time doing many fundamental work. We need to expand that to the other hazard. Because now, to work on functional recovery, to share, we have, I have, we have like 100 national SMEs working on that. In the beginning of the cycle, the question always comes up, how about the other hazard? How about the community? How about the lifeline? So we were constrained by our contract with FEMA. FEMA said, you know, that's our charge. We want to focus on buildings. We want to focus on the seismic first, right? We want to use that as a champion, as a starting point. But in the end, we need to expand this to mount hazard, expand this to lifeline, right? We need to design for the community res residents. We need to design for the climate change. That's the future. So to summarize, natural hazard is very costly, is deadly, is inevitable. We do have solutions slash options. Again, I will re reinforce the options. And the building owners need to ask the question, what kind of performance I'm getting for your design? Sometimes you were surprised, even for the functional recovery, the actual cost is not, much as, is not as much as you think. It's very minimal. But the current main building owners default assume their building is safe, they can bank to, the, bank to their building after major, major event. That's the uh, uh, false assumption. Again, owners need to ask the right question. Then mitigation make, makes economic sense, and then we, need to consider the, we need to consider the community resilience and the lifeline. Um, and this is my last slide. So um, many, of this, many of what I'm talking about here is really built upon the hundreds, even thousands of expert opinions. So I'm going to try to list some of the report or information that you got, uh, the link you guys can look into. Uh, I would like to invite you to dive into some of this report. Think about the options. So maybe options is the right word. Think about the options. Ask the right question. And with that, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to speak with all, all of you today. Yeah. Thank you, JQ. That was very informative, thoughtful, visionary, and I look forward to interacting with that subject with the panel and with our peers. So with that, I'll invite Paul, Geraldine, Greg to join us for the panel. We want to draw out this theme on mitigation saves. What does it save? 
saves money, it saves lives, saves reputational risk. That's called choreography in motion. As we begin and before we interact with the subject, we'll point out that OBO has an active climate security and resilience program. It is broad in nature, as indicated in the slide that I'm not going to go through. We have a program. We want it to be better. I love that JQ said, do we have solutions or options? And the answer is yes, maybe. We want them to be better. And for that, we want to engage with our peers. So we want to be also broad in our thinking today. Before I introduce the subjects, I'll introduce the panelists. We have Paul Seck. He is the COO and partner with Michael Van Velkenberg Associates. He has helped advance landscape-based approaches to environmental design, particularly with respect to integrated stormwater management. He has extensive expertise in every aspect of landscape architectural practice, leading some of their most technically complex projects, as well as its most intimately scaled gardens and plazas, a broad scope. He was advisor to the Special Initiative for Rebuilding and Resiliency convened by the City of New York to address resilience after Hurricane Sandy. So we look forward to hearing from him momentarily. We also have Dr. Geraldine Anderson, she's the President and CEO of Sustainable Transport Council, formerly Green Roads Foundation. It's a globally recognized nonprofit organization that leads the green and equitable transformation of the transport industry through education and independent third party sustainability rating of transport design and construction projects. She was designated as a White House Champion of Change for Transportation Technology in the 21st Century. She is a volunteer member of the Standing Committee on Environmental Analysis and Ecology and the Standing Committee of Rail, Transit, Infrastructure, Design and Maintenance for the Transportation Research Board of the National Academy of Science. Finally, we have Greg Starr. He's a member ex officio, a retired senior United States Foreign Service officer with a specialized career in the field of diplomatic security. He served at the State Department 33 years, ultimately as the Assistant Secretary of State for Diplomatic Security. He also served as Under Secretary General for Safety and Security at the United Nations. He was a senior official at the United Nations Security Management System overseeing the formulation of security policies and implementation to ensure operations of United Nations political, humanitarian, and relief activities were conducted in a secure environment. Those are our panelists. We look forward to hearing from them. We're going to consider mitigation saves. We want to consider how do we safeguard our diplomatic reputation. That is mitigation, mitigating institutional risk. We want to see how we build community resilience. JQ talked about that. That will be mitigating sociological risk. We also want to consider how we invest in a stable environment. That will be mitigating security risk. But before that, we want to interact for one minute or two with JQ's presentation and consider mitigation saves, immediate loss of lives, and money. With that, I'm going to ask Geraldine very quickly to respond to this question. If a financial investment in mitigation saves, how should we fund or prioritize that investment? We have a we have budget constraints. We all do. Whether, whether Congress makes that number high or low, it's still a constraint. You can't mitigate everything at once. Do you have suggestions on how, how do we prioritize and fund 
resilience investment? Well, thank you for the hardest question of the day. Uh, and thank you uh, very much for being here today and uh, for the opportunity to present and participate. Um, my answer to that question, uh, kind of wrapping in what we've talked about earlier this morning is number one, setting clear goals and priorities. And when you ask the question about prioritization, I think one of the questions that I heard in the room, maybe unstated, um, was to think about, well, what's possible first? And so uh, I think it was uh, Ms. Heidelberg who had said, what does success look like? Um, in shorthand, it, when you're sitting around the table doing a design charrette and thinking about what you can do, the first question that comes to my mind is not the constraints, it's actually what's possible. Um, and so if we start to think about one of my favorite questions, which is if we had a, you know, more than or unlimited amount of money, what would we actually do? And then what should we do? And then what shall we do um, after that? So in terms of prioritization, um, it, I would direct funds toward the, you know, those who are most impacted first um, and go to those community members and ask them what they need, listen to their advice and make it happen. Um, when, uh, just from my current context, um, you know, we, we learned a lot from the pandemic and it forced us in infrastructure to define what critical infrastructure was, what was essential. And so when you're thinking about prioritization of needs and who gets those investments and what infrastructure can do in terms of providing basic needs, public works needs to work for everyone, making sure that we meet basic health safety, life safety is a big component of that. Um, in order to have a resilient community, those needs must be met, basic human needs, water, sanitation, clean air, uh, all of those elements. And that's something your first infrastructure provides as well as the sites of these embassies and, and those kinds of things. So in terms of protecting that concept of meeting those basic needs, we could go through our whole portfolio and identify where those locations are, um, where those needs are not currently being met. And that becomes part of your strategy and some of those goals um, for setting um, funding priorities. That's my personal opinion. Um, and also thinking about what you can get in addition to that with limited funds. So once you've introduced that constraint, you know, you start thinking about those assumptions that you're making. We were having a conversation earlier about how long a project lasts. The lifetime is, what, 50 years from now? It's going to be there in 100 years. We, I, I'm not sure personally. Uh, but overall, you know, in reality, it may need to last less time. Uh, maybe the workplace, we were talking just a minute ago about the workplace changing and uh, people's mindsets change and that they need to have a readiness within the building itself in order to um, pursue whatever those needs are at the time. I think it was uh, Ms. Whitaker here who mentioned, you know, just being able to uh, always be ready for change. Change management came up earlier as well and, you know, the culture change, um, we can't today predict what we will be thinking about tomorrow. Um, we can, we could try, it sure is a fun exercise in terms of scenario planning, but the, the idea of uh, making sure those needs are met, I think that they're fundamental. And I think after going through COVID, which we've done collectively, you know, the need for belonging, community space, access for everyone, regardless of age, race, gender, um, worship, um, all of those pieces of our communities needs to be prioritized in, in terms of thinking about how we approach the problem in the first place. Thanks. Thank you very much, Geraldine. I'll invite anyone else on the panel or any of our peers to respond to the same question or some of what JQ presented around just minimizing loss of life in an event or functional resiliency. In, in, any other thoughts on that? We'll take just a few more minutes on that on the intro question. I'll take another shot. So I think, you know, like I said, is the option, is the awareness, the building owners, large building owners, homeowners, do they know what they get? So even if we ask ourselves, we ask our big project team the same question, Medicare saves, what's next? Where's the investment? Why nothing happens? Why are we still behind? So things are happening. So in, in fact, in the Congress level, in the federal government level, after that study, so FEMA gets a new program called BRIC, Building Resilience Infrastructure Communities. 
So for the previous authentication for the spending side, FEMA used to spend about 10 to $100 million. And last year, that funding increased to $2.5 billion. So the Congress or the government definitely step up their effort, try to be more prepared. But that's like a drop in the, in the bucket because if you look across the nation, that's not enough. It's really the market, like private sector, lenders, insurers, real estate. The benefit is really to everyone, to the, societal, to the society. Right? The lenders could have less payout, insurers, uh, lenders could have less default, and the real estate may have a better building, they can sell for a higher price. It's how to create that market signal. Is really, the consumer need to ask that. I think our private market need to respond to that. If you think about when you buy a house, using your self example, how many, how many of you are asking, do, do I have the current code? Is my building safe? Especially for those living in the high risk areas. Probably the top list is always location, location, location. Do I have a granite countertop or uh, uh, other things? So um, I think it really is, a, again, is a market penetration. We need to create this uh, uh, market awareness. Thank you. I think we'll broaden the discussion now and we'll look at safeguarding our diplomatic reputation or mitigating institutional risk. I might interject a little joke here. I was giving a tour to an ambassador. I was a project director and no offense to our architects here who had designed a white and black and gray color palette and I apologized because it looked so institutional. And he said, we are an institution after all. <laughs> and he's right. And the image is the State Department represents us worldwide. We saw in the, in the readout around Praia, one of the design challenges has to do with stormwater management. And I was coming back from lunch and I said, I heard this fantastic comment this morning by a peer landscape architecture knows no boundary. And he said, you must have been speaking to David Rubin. And he's right here. And I love the statement. And when I consider diplomatic reputation and what you see when you approach an embassy and what it means when you don't mitigate natural hazard, I wanted to start off the panel with a landscape architect. So I'll invite Paul to respond to an, invest in, an, investment, in resilient, an investment in resilience against natural hazards is an, invest, is an investment in mitigating institutional risk. And I'll ask you to respond to that. Um, first of all, I think, you know, we're landscape architects uh, have one of the best possibilities of helping us is with stormwater management. And I'd like to suggest that landscape is a good diplomat for that. And um, it's the front door, it's the power to create a setting, it makes things approachable, um, but it, it, it doesn't, it can't be gratuitous. It's not um, what we used to joke a long time ago, which was parsley around the pig, which meant it was the little pieces that went around the architecture. It actually can do work. Um, and I'd like to discuss not only the beauty of landscape, but also how when you back up and you look at the site in quotes and you think of property lines and boundaries and ownership, you need to, I think, initially back up and understand that there are many systems that you're connecting with and experiencing. Drainage, uh, circulation, utilities, if there are some, um, culture, and all of that needs to be uh, analyzed and looked at at an overall larger picture in order to provide um, not only resiliency, but creating um, an appropriate landscape that is good for the, the individual you're setting in. So with that being said, landscapes can be beautiful, but they can do work. Uh, two examples of that that we've uh, been fortunate enough to work on, one is the Brooklyn Botanic Garden in a very urban environment. Um, we created a, a water garden. The water garden um, moves up and down with the fluctuation of a pond that is actually tracked by weather events that we have on our iPhone, and that weather event translates into a certain water volume. That water volume of water leaves the pond before the weather event happens. And when it rains, we're able to contain all the storm water on our site, therefore not rippling these things down the line, and also reduce, it reduces flooding in the adjacent park next to us. Um, also at the Obama Presidential Center, um, which is you know, re reinvigoration of the 
south side of Chicago, um, an existing park sort of not taken care of, had a lot of flooding issues, um, and was next to a historic lagoon um, that had been Army Corps um, created and, and completed. We created adjacent to that a park and a garden that was able to, um, during severe weather events, a park that was normally used during dry days would flood and hold the water capacity and let it percolate into the soil. All of this is water volume calculations, understanding where your watersheds are, dealing with the stormwater from the presidential center itself. All of this is interesting and very good and you know nice, but the really comes down to communication. If you're going to have um, these efforts, you need to, I think, show these efforts with your neighbors, explain to them what you're doing, and show that you're putting your best foot forward. Therefore, I think, you know, the diplomacy of uh, you know showing up into a new neighborhood goes a lot further. Thank you. Any any comment response from the peers? I'll I'll take this one. Um, so as a civil engineer who's been working for over thirty years, I now understand how deficient my designs are for the past thirty years, and that is because we're all witnessing climate change. And the uh, basic rainstorm has changed in whether you're here in the US or abroad. And it changes differently in different places. And I think when you're talking about, and you know, when Paul was talking about those things, and he actually involved in one of them, it's, it's a few things that he said I think we really should uh, focus on. And one of them is the landscape is really critical to the stormwater system. It, it's part of it. It should be taken into account. It gives function to, this, to the uh, landscape. The other thing that he uh, so uh, wisely said, he's talked about the area around it, and more, more specifically, the watershed. Because where the site lies within the watershed is what water's gonna go through your site. And so one thing that you're doing on an embassy and you're looking at whatever the size site is, you control that site. You don't control what's around you. And so I think what we're finding more on a, you know, just a evolution of how civil engineering, how stormwater is designed, we recognize that, um, you know, climate is changing faster than we are, that, you know, the way we calculate single storm events are probably not accurate anymore. So when we do a typical evaluation of a site and we're meeting the regulations and you're looking at a storm that lasts 24 hours for a certain depth, Yes, there's lots of changes in the rainfall data. There's lots of estimates what's going to happen in the future. But the bottom line is what's happening with climate change is it's no longer the 24-hour storm that is a problem. It is the seven inches in an hour and a half. It is the 11 inches in 12 hours. It is the you know uh, Hurricane Harvey stalling for three days in Houston. So. We need, as a you know, as a profession, to start looking at different ways to ana analyze things, and one is continuous simulation. But for a single site, not looking at the watershed, probably the most critical thing to do is understand what's happening around you, and really to understand what's going through you. And in these storms that are occurring now, um, one just happened in Massachusetts. It, they estimated as a, at a thousand-year storm. Okay. No, none of the drainage is going to uh, function during that storm. However, from a resilient standpoint, what you need to look at is what's happening with that water and how can you allow it to pass through your site without destroying your site. So there's a whole nother layer that needs to be looked at, especially when you're looking at a single site within a watershed. You need to look beyond just what the local regulations say or standard engineering practices, and we're moving in that direction. You can move a lot quicker, but it's, it's there. But people are aware of it, and we're really trying to do it. And it's really important to understand just how important the landscape is in that process. Um, because if you're going to pass water through your site, let me tell you, the landscape, the vegetation, the trees, they all play a part in protecting that site and be able to survive that storm. The other big key and important thing is a lot of these storms are extremely local, meaning it will, it will hit a town and that's it, or hit a part of the town, and five miles away or 10 miles away, it's not the same storm, and nothing happens there. So you have to balance, and I, and I think, as the presentation indicated, it's a balance between 
you know, the cost, the benefit. And so there's, we have to look at things differently now. And I think that's a big key. And we're on the road there. I don't think we're there yet, but I think that's what we need to really be looking at. Very good, thank you. We will broaden our lens again. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, just thinking about the topic of you know FEMA and then local regulations and then different regulations in different parts of the world as well and uh, and how do you get to good you know how do you get to good because um, you know I'm building this crazy deck in New Jersey and every time the, in the inspector comes by he or she adds something to it and I know that none of my neighbors have this and I will be able to have a party of sumo wrestlers on my deck when this deck is done. But then I also think about a building I built in Fort Lauderdale. And um, that building uh, was, was finished um, four months before a major hurricane. And it was the only building that still had lights on after the hurricane. And neighborhoods were knocked out. Not whole neighborhoods, half of neighborhoods in different areas, to your point. But what we were able to do because that building stood and that building had lights on is that we were able to not only provide charging options for our, our associates to come in and take care of so that they could communicate with their family members who were very worried about them, but we were also able to um, make meals for our associates and their families for a week following because there was no power in the area. Um, but then we also had to think about security of the site and with, you know, as the lights were on and everything else was dark, keeping that site safe. So this interdependency of your point about interdependency of services in the space was really you know, something to think about also. But the ability to actually um, manifest a space of, of trust because the lights stayed on, we built a brand as you know, magnet for talent coming in, great brand in the environment. Um, we had two buildings actually, one of them we weren't using, so we called um, Broward County up and said, hey, we have an extra building. Would you like to use it? It's got full generator. Do you want to use it? And, uh, and there were, at the last minute, there was a little fight between you know, two, you know, the fire department and the police department, who was going to get the keys as you know, they both came towards us as we were at the front door. Um, but what they ended up using it for wasn't to actually occupy the space. And we were thinking about, could we house people there, and how would we do that with security? But actually, they ended up using the garage, the layers of the garage, to store their emergency vehicles as the water rose. So it's all of these aspects of this interdependency of services in a, in a location, but also within a space that actually provide, I think, pretty amazing opportunities. But it's what does good look like? Like in a crisis, what does good look like? I think it's a really interesting topic. Thank you. And that was a fantastic segue to the security topic. But first, we want to look at the sociological aspects. And the image on the screen is, is the cover of this book, The Children of Katrina. And Dr. Lori Peek, who actually inspired this session today, she's a sociologist that works with a civil engineering PhD student, if you can imagine those two working together. And she followed the lives of families that were impacted by Hurricane Katrina, and now it's not just immediate loss of life, but how do you disrupt communities and families, and what's the cost of that? And mitigation saves that kind of cost as well. And with that, we'll invite uh, Geraldine to respond to how do we uh, how do we build sociological resilience? So the second hardest question of the day. Uh, so I think there's a couple things that. Uh, that I've been processing a little bit of when we were um, talking about the last question. Um, and I mentioned we have these impacts that last a long time. And one thing I've noticed about working in sort of public spaces is that we are very initial cost focused. Um, so if we flipped around, and I think this Dr. JQ actually mentioned this as well, is the idea of full cost accounting, not just life cycle costs, but environmental costs, uh, the costs of climate change and mitigation, and then what the value add of mitigation is. To me, maybe it is not necessarily a, um, an add, it's a must, it's a must do. Um, 
oddly enough, when I was doing my PhD at, in civil engineering, um, what we found was the first steps for a lot of agencies was to add the phrase and sustainability to a mission statement, um, which is a great start because you're acknowledging that it's a need and it's something that's important. Um, similarly, with sociological or community resilience, adding that phrase into the language that you're starting to talk about with your teams and you know you policy decisions, policy is um, pretend permanent. Uh, it's one of those things that you walk away from after you've gotten your budget allocation or your, your legislation passed. Um, it is not permanent. We can change those things. So I think it's important to understand uh, in terms of what resilience actually means is in, a, in an ability to adapt to change and the speed of being able to do that is sometimes um, the, the biggest challenge, um, whether it's, you know, schedule on a project management level or the long range of, you know, generational equity. Um, and I will throw out a term that I was thinking about just a minute ago is when we're approaching new embassies or we're approaching uh, new, new locations for siting, um, thinking about the term restorative justice, um, if it was something that we did uh, in a mitigation mindset, versus buying a new property um, and then taking an opportunity to make the space better for other folks uh, that are in that community and what that looks like, that that whole process of wealth generation for the community, keeping those funds in the community, workforce development, all of those pieces really come into sort of the approach for uh, sociological impacts, which makes you look better, reputation risk, and in in terms of providing safety and security, life safety above all, um, and making sure that compliance is um, built into some of the codes that we're using for, for that. Um, I don't know that, that the, I don't know that we are trying to culturally replicate uh, wherever we go in the world, but ultimately uh, bringing the values of you know, democracy and inclusion, and, and that is the approach that um, will add value in the long term, not necessarily reduce costs, but if we are doing a full cost investing or full cost um, and doing the right project at the right time, that, that will add our intergenerational value that we've been looking for. Thank you very much. And that also ties right over. I ask you to turn your mic there. Turn your mic back off, please. And we will turn now to, to Greg Starr. This image, it's from data in 2020 that shows displacements of people for security reasons versus natural hazard reasons. And in some places in the world, in fact, those overlap so that a natural hazard can trigger security and stability. So how do we invest in stability and what are thoughts around security resilience? We'll, we'll hear from Greg Starr. Um, in I left the Department of State in 2009 and went up to the United Nations, um, became the Under Secretary General for Safety and Security. And I thought I was reasonably prepared, having had a 29 year you know, career here in the State Department. And I walked in one morning early in 2010, and there had been an earthquake in Chile. The United Nations nine story office building, headquarters building, had collapsed, killing virtually every senior officer in the United Nations in, uh, sorry, in Haiti, in Haiti, uh, Port-au-Prince. Um, and the entire city of Port-au-Prince was devastated. It was one of the worst earthquakes that had happened in years. And if we're gonna talk about representation, uh, or the reputational ability to, you know, diplomatic reputation, I think on that day when the United Nations could not respond to the biggest earthquake that ever took place in Haiti where thousands and thousands were killed. Virtually half the city was destroyed. Social services completely broke down. Never very good in Haiti to begin with, but at least they were somewhat functioning. And the collapse of that building, which had not been looked at closely in terms of earthquake survival or anything. The Secretary General Special Representative was killed along with all the international staff and most of the 
headquarters local staff, and the inability to respond was one of the worst things, that, worst crises, internal crises that the United Nations had to undergo. And quite frankly, our reputation and Haiti in particular, which wasn't great to begin with, was pretty much shot after that. You compare that to about a mile down the road, a United States embassy that had been recently completed, and security standards often overlap with structural standards, with earthquake standards, with all the different things. And the United States Embassy not only survived, it became the lead for every bit of relief that happened in, in Haiti at that point. While the international community, while the United Nations was digging out its own people, finding families and houses that had collapsed and trying to move the bodies out and reconstitute the UN, the United States Embassy, which had the proper tools, the proper planning, the proper you know, items to continue to function and serve as a much larger headquarters for a massive relief effort, put the United States in a position that few others could have done. Um, if you looked at the U.S. Embassy in the days after that, when helicopters from the Navy started coming in, Coast Guard, we couldn't, the port was shot, by the way, as well. Everything was standoff, the, the airport was closed, but we were getting helicopters in. But a tent city grew up around the U.S. Embassy. And almost everything in the national government and the relief efforts was done out of the United States Embassy. And it was one of these, you know, stark contrasts between, you know, planning and not planning, being in a safe an upgraded facility not being in a safe and upgraded facility. So you talk about reputational risk, and it, it really highlights as, as much as you can get in anything that I ever had to go through. About six or eight months later, that year, I walked in my office. My people came running up and said, there's been a massive earthquake in Chile. And I think I just sort of shrunk for a moment and said, oh, God, is this you know, another, what, is the UN still functioning? What, what happened? What's going on in Chile? Well, in, in, a, in an event that was as, could have been as cataclysmic as the one in Haiti, an earthquake that was approximately the same size, the same depth, and the same distance, nothing happened. Virtually nothing happened in Chile. Why was that? It took some time to figure out, but in 1960, Chile had suffered a massive earthquake that had devastated half of the country. And after that earthquake, in Chile, a, a poor country, governance was somewhat questionable, dictatorships at some point, budding democracy in other places, Chile managed to put in place building standards to protect against earthquakes not expensive ones, inexpensive ones. I mean, Chile wasn't, you know, wasn't a, a gleaming example of Western wealth at that point. But every house that was built, you know, they went around and started saying, you need to tie together the foundation to the joist, the joist to the roof, little things that, that helped individual residences. And then somehow in a, in a society that was incredibly poor, avoided the corruption that usually goes with building standards, high-rise buildings were built to earthquake standards. And, and 50 years later, and I realize that's a long period of time, but proper planning and carry through over 50 years, the, the difference in what happened in Chile, which was not devastated, minimal deaths, the money that did not have to go to recovery, to, to social um, efforts, the, the, the fact that law, law and order did not break down, schools were still open, electricity was still going on. The dichotomy, the, the, when we compared what happened in Chile versus what happened in Haiti, we began to realize that things like international building standards, yeah then going hand in hand with making sure that trying to get these things not compromised by corruption in countries on a daily basis, stopping the payoff so that you didn't have to do these minor things, really truly paid dividends. And for me, from a safety and security standpoint, law enforcement standpoint, 
you know, you look at Haiti today, which, as I said, wasn't great to start before the earthquake, but has gotten worse and worse. And the amount of money that was spent on recovery, the amount of money that could have gone to development or other types of things that didn't, and where Haiti is today versus looking at where Chile is today. I, I look at, you know, you talk about a, a one to six or six to one payback yeah. when you do these things. I, I have to figure that in, in places where you've actually done the proper planning, where you've implemented the proper techniques, where you're doing things, it, it can't be six to one. It's got to be a hundred to one. So I just, I, I use that as an example that, you know, these places didn't lose their society, really, in a, in a disaster. And for me, it's the two starkest examples, and it was my, probably my worst year, 2010, but um, it's, it's the thing that I've carried with me since then, and then back to the Department of State. So I'll just leave it at that. It's, it's the starkest example I can, I can provide. Thank you. And we may have time for one or two comments from the peers. Any, any response? Options, solutions, how do we get to good? What's the return on investment? Um, the JQ, since I sell engineering services, thank you, I'm on board. Um, but I, I think in terms of your new buildings, your new buildings, um, you're probably already at um, a, a, a functional recovery position for most of your new buildings, right? I mean. In fact, in fact, I would lobby that you might start considering using performance-based design more regularly instead of prescriptive because you can probably pull back in some regards and be smarter about it. Um, but if you are thinking about this in terms of your own stock, which is different than a, a stock over the whole, over a whole country, um, it would be, I think, uh, uh, good for you to focus on your existing building stocks. Right, you know the historical buildings that that are probably in the group of buildings that you have the ones that are at most at risk, um, and then I, I I just imagine that in terms of criteria for new buildings you could you could even get smarter about it because I, I know you have really robust buildings at this point for the new ones. I th I think that also highlights the need for the interdisciplinary. Uh, we need to strengthen that, that piece because if one thing is doing something else already, we could be more efficient uh, in, in the building design. In, any last word? We'll give it to David. Um, thank you. I, it's, it's a compelling panel and greatly appreciated. I think looking back through history, and I think it's always important to look back to understand what not to repeat or what to repeat in a context of moving a society forward. Um, in, and thank you, Paul, for your comments. and. Um, you know, this notion, I think, particularly for sight and uh, to stand along Sandy uh, on so many occasions, it, it should be realized that we should be pushing the notion of infrastructure with social overlay as opposed to social overlay supported by infrastructure. That the context of, of uh, infrastructure with social overlay is, you know, Olmsted did it in Central Park. This is, that's a living machine in the context of an urban environment. The WPA era works, uh, you know, trying to put people back to to a, live, a standard of living. But the, you know, you look at WPA bridges and you see benches embedded in them because there was a social context in the context of a piece of infrastructure. Um, you know, to, today nothing is completed in isolation, as you say, right? That this is actually um, Tracy very much about um, uh, everything doing more than one thing. But this notion, I think, for new embassies in particular, notwithstanding your older properties, is that it should be considered infrastructure with social overlay. That there is a machine in place that is working and functioning that allows you, um, as was cited earlier, the capacity to do storytelling and influencing and therefore supportive of diplomacy. And I, I think that that is, that is a guiding force uh, for resiliency in the context of Natu increasing natural disasters and uh, the Im impacts that climate crisis are um, affording us um, in, in the prospect of moving forward successfully. Thank you, and please let's give a round of applause to our panel.
think we agree mitigation saves and we will go with that to the next portion of our, our meeting. So what we'll do is invite <clears throat> the, the uh, OBO director to the podium. I will join for some questions we have on Slido. And if you have questions from the room, let's go ahead and queue up. You've got two microphones at the back of the room and we'll uh, turn to the uh, public engagement portion of our program. So since people are shy and they're not queuing up in the back, we'll go to the Slido questions first. Uh, are there any major new challenges that OBO sees on active construction projects abroad post-COVID? Uh, would supply chain be an exaggeration? Uh, uh, you know, labor shortages, supply chain. Uh, no, what else, Tracy? Uh, those are the two big ones. Well, cost escalation, just the general uh, increase in inflation, which I am hoping, you know, I am actually one of these optimists that believes that this, that this will probably even out as supply chain uh, issues uh, leave out, uh, even out. But I do think the surprise, one of the most surprising things for me has been the number of, of uh, labor force issues we've had all over the world. And they don't appear in just one country, they appear in a multiple number of countries. Rick, you wanted to add something? I was going to say local politics, permitting, stuff like that's always a challenge for us. That's, that's sort of par for the course. All right, so uh, what are the most significant changes you have seen to the U.S. building program abroad? And what do you uh, envision as the next biggest area of challenge or growth? Hmm. Boy. I think we talked about it all afternoon. Yeah, I think we did. <laughs> uh, you know, I think, you know, one of the things is, and I am actually very much a believer, and I think all of my uh, staff are, that the building program is always going to evolve. Partly that's because we, uh, we work in a, an environment very much uh, influenced by world events. And, uh, you know, to give you an example of, of, of the real thing that's happened, six months ago, I didn't know we were going to actually open two consulates in, uh, in India. Uh, but now, this is something that is one of the administration's top priorities. Uh, so, we're always going to have these kinds of challenges where the, the, politi uh, the politics of the world really start to influence us. Now, what we want to see in the future, in the future, in our building program, uh, and this is when I talk about the rein, uh, reinvention, that I think that we are at a point where we start to have to look at applied technology that will save work. And I think that there are some things. Now, I don't, I am not, I do not want to do uh, projects that are technology for technology's sake, but I do want to look at ways uh, where we actually use some technological solutions to make our buildings work better. But if I can say a shout out to my landscape architects, I am a huge believer in what they're talking about, about making our buildings more res uh, resilient by making the landscapes work. Because I have seen this, wor uh, seen this myself about how bad landscaping just creates problems. And so this is something uh, because it's not only the technological side, it's also the natural side, and we need to be looking at both simultaneously. All right, sir, do you believe that the U.S. diplomatic built footprint abroad will continue to grow at the pace that it has over the past 40 years? Uh, well, I think that, you know, one of the things is what I talked about um, a little bit today, both this morning and this afternoon, is uh, we want our approach to now be what we call facility solutions. In other words, we want to do the right facility uh, in, uh, in the country for what is the best thing that, that, that can help. This means, in, in very practical sense, something that, uh, that is very obvious to, uh, to me and I think to, the, uh, uh, to our staff in OBO, is that uh, we've got to get, we had, if we had continued on our path where we were talking about we're only going to be buildings for, uh, build buildings for security reasons, we would be talking about building a new building in Paris. Of course, it would probably be located in Marseille <laughs> and for us to get a location that would work. <laughs> yes. But that's the point. 
You know, one of the things is about looking at, and then one reason why I'm so passionate about our changes in the mission statement is to remind us that location matters a great deal for diplomacy. Because if you're not where your diplomats can be effective, then you have lost sight of what the purpose is. And there were, there have been too many buildings that have been built that really did not look about what was going to be the most effective location for our diplomatic uh, operations. And that means we're losing sight of what we are really about because we are, at our essence, that's the reason we exist is to do that. And that's the reason why I'm very focused on those words, the most effective uh, facility for the diplomacy. How about, uh, how do you balance facilities that are being architecturally over-designed with no full grasp on the cost to maintain or meet the needs of the actual workers? Uh, well, uh, I pray a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I have my, you know, I am not, I want to say very clearly that I appreciate some of the wonderful design work that's been done. And one of the things that was said today that I am really, really uh, believe in too, and I want to thank my peers for this, um, you know, we don't need less design, we need more design. <laughs> because we need designs that are going to make sense to adapt to our environment and or adapt to our current circumstances. And that's probably more design and more planning. And I actually see the logic of this. So, uh, and I think the logic is evident if you understand what we're trying to accomplish. So, uh, yes, we have some facilities that I think the designs in the past were over the top and they've taken a long time to complete. And there will be maintenance challenges, but we're going to have to address those. Uh, the good thing is that they are going to be modern buildings and we will have a, and, and done to a higher standard and we will have some time where uh, we will get some benefit out of that. But they are, but it is a, a challenge for the future that we're, it's going to be increased in our bottom line on maintenance costs, it is going to be a, a, a net increase, and it's something we are going to have to reckon with. All right, a switch to uh, oh. a broader question, a question about the I got to have some, I got to have at no, least one least question for Rick. Yeah, I got a couple more. <laughs> you know, last year Rick got all the questions, okay. so, and, okay. and remember we have a microphone in the room oh, wait, too. There is one on here for Rick. Okay. How about this? When is the new design IDIQ expected? Uh, will it change to include a robust workplace strategy scope given that post-pandemic uh, how we inhabit buildings has changed? That's not really necessarily a Rick question, more of a uh, <laughs> contracting officer question for our, for our Bureau, Administrative Bureau of Acquisition Management, but uh, I believe we're working on our new design IDAQ that's going to go out this year. Um, I do not know all the details. I think some of the details of what's going to be in it is still kind of being formulated, so uh, I don't want to uh, promise anything that may not be in there, but uh, we're, we're trying to make it uh, more robust every time we do it. Well, and if I heard someone, it might have been Nat earlier, who said, you might need to delay the thing to get the thing right. So if we need to delay the IDIQ to get it right to add the scope, maybe we should think about it. I don't know, I'm just saying. Again, the schedule, AQM is the schedule, and uh, yeah. we can't let the old ones lapse necessarily. That's, so. Well, that's <laughs> right. that is certainly true. All right, the, de the department is uniquely positioned because it provides workplace and housing. Mm -hmm. Has the department considered integration to reduce commute and cluster housing for FSOs? Uh, we actually do that constantly in any case. Um, but it's always a, 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 a multiplicity of, of factors. And I'll give a real world example of this. Uh, we, you know, at one time, uh, people in Athens were closer, were close to the embassy. The problem is they found out that none of this, uh, none of the housing that they were occupying would, uh, would survive an earthquake. So in order to, uh, to reduce our seismic risk, there's been a conscious effort in order to move people to safer housing, which is newer housing, and it's usually a little bit, it is further away. Um, but we do try, and I'll give you an example from my own uh, experience. When I was in Kazakhstan, uh, we had an apartment building that, that People with the people who were probably prominently connected to the government had built a huge apartment building across the street from the embassy, and we managed to put a substantial number of our staff there because they literally could walk to work every day, and it was something that they really appreciated. 
but we're, but housing and you know housing is done by the post but you know people at the post are looking to find the best uh, 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 you know the best deal for their uh, employees and then they try to balance these factors to do it and they do it with some advice from us now I'll tell you this the the thing that's always funny about this we have a lot of people in the State Department that come back from overseas and they complain I have to commute in Washington uh, so their problem is not when they're overseas, it's actually uh, when it's here. And I'll just add a little, little on the end of that to say that um, when we think about a new embassy location, we absolutely take the, the location of the housing into consideration as a factor in site acquisition. Yeah. Because we know that you know, if, you're, if all the schools are two hours away, uh, you know, then you're going to, that's, you know, not going to really help us in terms of, like, lo the right. location of the NEC. So, um, like, the transition from Grosvenor Square to Nine Elms, one of the things we, we were able to do when we knew we were moving there was to actually buy some units closer to Nine Elms to capitalize on the fact that we'd, we'd want. We'd want to take advantage before the market changed, before the land prices went up, before the housing prices right. went up. And, um, and so we're always trying to look at, um, at opportunities like that. All right. Uh, what investments will OBO be making to adapt existing buildings for resiliency and full functional code requirements? Well, we have a, uh, a new process called the capital planning process. The top 80 that we had had for many years is being retired. And in capital planning process, one of the factors is actually the, the condition of the building and whether it uh, and whether it is deficient in these kinds of things in code uh, in code compliance or uh, particularly in environmental resilience. Uh, when we do our new ranking of posts, uh, that, that it, it still includes security. But when we do the real uh, the the new ranking, the number one post in the world is uh, Manila. Uh, because it already has active flooding and, and, and essentially there isn't really a big, there isn't, there's some security considerations but, the, but, the, but they are actually in an actual real threat of having their plat current platform washed away. And so we're starting to weigh the factors where the threats are and the real, uh, 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 are real and the, and the ones that really threaten our present. Will uh, considerations between operating costs versus capital expenditures budgets influence the design or program of diplomatic facilities? Yes, they do already, and yes, they will, and they will influence them more and more. In fact, we actually have quite a bit of flexibility uh, to move money now in our capital security cost sharing program from capital security cost sharing into maintenance cost sharing, and there's a recognition that we have to be able to make intelligence choices between those two. Uh, regarding applied technology and resiliency, what is the OBO strategy for utilizing smart technology, smart buildings to make operations more efficient? Uh, Rick, you want to start with that one? Sure. Uh, that, that's a tough one for us. I mean, obviously, we're trying to build uh, modern buildings uh, in often uh, developing countries without technical staff that can maintain those smart buildings, right? So it's kind of always a challenge. Um, we're trying hard to be uh, energy efficient. Sometimes that takes, uh, you know, we, we try to do it with passive design, stuff like that as best we can. Uh, once we start introducing technology to get, squeeze that little bit more out there, sometimes we run into maintenance concerns. And we're always trying to balance it and every country's a little bit different um, on what that approach may be, but uh, certainly a challenge for us. I have no more Slido questions, so get those fingers moving. Or does it look like someone? Yeah, oh, we have so, yes, someone stepping up. I have a question. My name is Adam Bodner. Uh, I'm a private consultant, but I used to be the director of real property management here for uh, domestic facilities. Right. Uh, anyway, nice to see you guys. I wanted to ask about when you're sizing new facilities or planning for and programming for new spaces, uh, most agencies and entities are sort of settling on the hybrid approach. It's sort of a, sort of a blanket. It's two days a week or it's two days of pay period. Right. Without getting more specific about the actual functions that different teams do, and are you are you starting to get more deeper so you can build? Because some teams do need to be in the or Some teams would function better together and cl more collaboratively more frequently, and other people do more heads down work and don't. And it, could you get to that level of performance detail and build a program up from that? Uh, Adam, you know, I would like to get to the point where we have more serious discussion about this. And it's a very, but one of the things I've said earlier today. I can't go to Congress and tell them that I am going to build 
uh, facilities for people who are going to work at home. Because the, uh, the uh, you know, a cost to put a, a, a foreign service uh, employee overseas is between 500000 uh, $500, and a million dollars a year. And they're not going to pay those costs if they can avoid them. So we have to be very clear that we are building office spaces for people that are going to occupy offices. Now, I think we will see some evolution in this, but at this point, I think it's, uh, uh, it is probably too soon to, to go with a more radical approach about incorporating hybrid workforces in our over, overseas, because Congress is already so sensitive about the cost. Thank you. Another couple of questions on Slido. What are some of the biggest facilities management challenges you see today? Uh, well, let me see. How many historical properties do I have? Um, you know, and, and I'll tell you, I don't, you know, and like I say, I'm not uh, against historical properties per se, uh, but I have about 30 some, I think. Does that sound right? Uh, yeah, or more. Yeah, and, they're, and for the most part, the ones that I have really trouble with are houses. The problem is uh, that, uh, you know, the, and, and this is just a real, you know, this is just the facts of life. Congress thinks a nice house should cost $5 million. And, uh, and that is true in many parts of the world. But when we start talking about t taking 20 or $30 million to, maintain, to repair a house, they're, give, they're greeting this with a great deal of skepticism. And one of our current embassies for the house on the Champs-Élysées in Paris, our master's residence there, which is an iconic residence, that the renovation cost of that would be $250 million to $300 million. So, and, um, and I always tell people about the, the, the houses, to not, look at the, uh, not, to not look at the American press about this, where if you want some insight about how this really works in a democratic country, look at what has happened to the Prime Minister's house in, in Canada, where despite years of the, of, of the requests by the various Canadian governments to renovate the house, they can never get it passed by Congress, uh, by their parliament. And I think the cost there is probably I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's 50 to 100 million dollars, but the, no, no legislature that's elected uh, and has to report to its voters will pass, uh, uh, will pass a bill allocating this money. So this is my problem with the historical residences. The money to, uh, uh, the money to maintain them is, is something Congress likes to stay in them when they go overseas, but they're never go but I feel that it's <laughs> unlikely that they're going to vote for the resources in order to maintain them. So I am, uh, it is something that really plagues me a great deal uh, because it's just, it is a very much something where I think we have a significant budget shortfall on the maintenance side. So a different question. It's been observed that studies keep occurring on projects through several firms over the course of uh. 10 years. How are you working to make a decision on completing? Let me tell you something. You know, this morning I talked to the, uh, the peers about this at length. It's called churn, and I hate it. And what I want to do is, uh, and all my managing directors know this, if we've studied a property more than once, it is already, uh, it is, uh, the second time is one too many. Uh, because if we weren't able to get the information that we needed out of the first study, why, uh, why are we studying it again? So um, I have actually asked my comptroller to let me know uh, when, uh, uh, when individual uh, uh, directorates are spending money on studies, and uh, I had the chance to ask the question about why. Uh, because I'm, uh, this is something that really uh, the, disturbs me a great deal. Because uh, the, the accelerating the, the decision-making process in OBO will help a great deal in accelerating our operations. Because at one point, you have to make a decision. And even sometimes if they're a bad decision, it's better than endlessly uh, 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 dis discussing the issue. All right, moving on to renewable energy sources. Mm. What is OBO's strategy to increase the adoption of renewable, renewable energy sources, and what are the technologies being considered? Well, I look upon this in a, in a lot of different ways. One of the proposals that we have uh, that we have on the table is that this year, 
we will do a, a virtual year where we will manage for all of our, uh, the, our official office buildings overseas a, the, their energy costs. With the eye that in 25, that OBO would transfer, do a base transfer from the regional bureaus to OBO, all of the, the, uh, the energy costs for the world, uh, for all the post overseas. Uh, now, the reason I wanted to do this is we have money in our energy program, and we do spend money on energy projects. But what we need to do is to take a look corporately and look at the entire world and decide where could we get the best payback in a short period of time uh, for, uh, on, the, uh, on the utility costs if we, uh, and, if we, and make the investments uh, appropriately. Now, I, have not, I do not think you need to do detailed analysis in order to figure out that posts that are operating on diesel generator fuel 24-7 uh, uh, are probably are those posts, and they are going to be the ones which I consider low-hanging fruit, that if you have, if you can obtain the land and, able, and you're able to put in enough uh, either solar or wind power or whatever alternative energy supply you want to do, you'll get a very, very fast payback. Uh, the, the question will be is, though, given in the current public, uh, budget climate, can I get the full amount that I need in order to pay all the energy bills and do this at the same time? And this is going to be a budget negotiation, but we are collecting the data now. Second element of this, though, is uh, residential solar. We're currently, the, the, uh, the, we're currently uh, conducting a pilot in, uh, in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, and a couple other South Africa posts. Uh, using uh, residential solar, uh, uh, using residential size solar panels with battery systems in order to uh, uh, to see if this will work. Now, Cape Town's an interesting situation because many of the pe the, the, the many of the, the, the our employees that live in uh, uh, the, that live there actually live in apartments and not in houses, and so the, the neighbors will not allow them to have generators. So as South Africa has increasing in, in the numbers of rolling backouts, they're actually completely without power. So this was the, the, the ideal place to try uh, this pilot of, uh, of using uh, solar that, so that they would actually have something during the blackout. And we actually even received recently from the Department of Energy another $2 million. Uh, that didn't come to us, though. It went to, well, it did come to us. Is that right, Rick? It came to the department. It came to the department. Right. But we do the advice on how to do this. Uh, but the idea is that I want to then go to, um, uh, to our shared administrative cost platform and try to have a conversation about making loans for the posts where the solar costs are so high, uh, where the energy costs are so high, so that we, we, we could do this. Many of them are on the African continent, I'll be honest with you. And this is one thing um, I, I'm always, uh, I always have to say this. In 1985, uh, uh, I was a general service officer in Bamako, Mali, and I will never forget the, putting my stomach on top of the tank, the fuel tank uh, truck, so that I could put the, uh, the wooden dipstick in the truck and measure if the level was correct and also then run my fingers across it to make sure that they hadn't put water in it to fill up the tank. This is what you get from a diesel fuel pro program. The diesel is not only bad for the environment, uh, dirty, and noisy because it runs the generators, it's also a tremendous area of, uh, of theft. Uh, many of our overseas posts, and we have countless instances of, of where there have been schemes to try to steal diesel fuel. So I look upon our, our getting these posts off of, uh, of uh, diesel fuel use as a security issue because they don't have to have the material stored on the compound, and they also don't have to worry about employee theft as much if they, uh, 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 if they can get off of this. So there's a lot of very, very uh, good benefits that you can get out of trying to change the dynamic on this. Do you have a question in the back? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Jenny Kadiamaki, I'm an architect with Machado Silvetti in Boston. Um, in a previous uh, position, I designed international schools, um, uh -huh. which you all know well, they educate the, the kids of the diplomatic corps. Um, and so similar projects in some ways, right, they're overseas, some security concerns. And my 
eyes absolutely popped when I started working on embassies at the difference in construction cost. What? I realize um, security drives some of that, but in my estimation, a big driver is the use of US-based contractors versus local contractors. Has any consideration been given to, um, to, to using more local uh, direct uh, contractors? Well, one of the initiatives that, uh, you know, I've talked a little bit about our uh, representational facilities, and one of the things we want to drive that program to is to use uh, more local contractors in order to take care of, uh, of uh, official residences overseas. Uh, in our official buildings, we actually, our legislation mandates that we do use American contractors, and I think Congress will be loath to change that. Um, uh, because of the, uh, because the, the, it's long standing, and I, I would have to make a really good financial argument about how much money it would save us before I think I could get any traction. Um, but it is something to, uh, uh, to really talk to, uh, talk to congressional staff about that we that, that remind them that this is one thing that does push, push up our call spaces a great deal. So thank you for that comment. And I think there's time for one last question. Um, mm -hmm. and there are more questions on here than we have time for, so what I think we'll do is undertake to uh, get these, get answers to them, and then post them along the lines of wherever we would post all mm -hmm. the materials. So um, what area of the world will OBO be focusing its efforts on over the next few years? Uh, it's all areas. <laughs> that doesn't change. Uh, you know, one of the things is, uh, I, I have a, uh, I'll tell you this, it's a little humorous. I have a slide. That gives uh, that I use to brief ambassadors, and it says Obo works uh, on the very first uh, top of the slide says Obo works in 287 locations around the world, and so when I have an ambassador or a principal officer in the uh, in, in the, one of these briefings, I say to them, you know, you are special to me, but you've got 286 other people who are also special, <laughs> and that is to give people an idea that Oboe is focused on every post, but uh, there, we have to, uh, and that's the whole point, we have to take care of everyone. And we really can't opt out of saying one place is more important than another. We have to always have our mind on taking care of the entire uh, diplomatic platform overseas, because that's the, the, that is the responsibility that we've been charged with. So, I wanna say a, a couple words in closing Thank you all very much for attending today. This has been extremely valuable for me. I first of all want to thank our, uh, our peers and, uh, uh, once again and a big round of applause for them. And I want to thank Victoria and Tracy uh, and, uh, and, and Chelsea and Rick, who did much of the uh, work in, in terms of, uh, of the, a lot of the substantive discussion today. And, and I couldn't do my job without their uh, contributions. And then, uh, over, and then the one group that I have to thank is the external affairs group, uh, Lauren Luckett and, uh, <laughs> and Tim. And uh, Lauren and, and the people that, and, in external affairs keep the IAG process going year round. Uh, and they're the ones that arrange all the times when we have the, uh, the peer consulting sessions and, uh, and the various meetings and then the industry reviews. But this, this is an essential function uh, that really uh, makes OBO work. Um, as I've said, this has been extremely valuable for me. Uh, because I get new ideas and I have a chance to, and I think we all do, and uh, uh, all my staff and, 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 and me, we all receive ideas that really help us do our jobs better. And that is the reason we have this consultation process. Uh, we're lucky uh, because it's very hard for my colleagues that are doing policy work to go out and say, well, they want to go consult with a private industry group to get policy ideas. It doesn't work out quite, uh, uh, quite as well. But this, in this case, it is very valuable for us, and I want to thank all of you for your contributions today. And then I'll do one administrative announcement. Uh, we're, going to get, uh, we're going to try to talk, avoid talking to you in this room uh, and try to get you to go over across the hall uh, to the, um, uh, the delegates' lounge. Yes, the delegates' lounge to the delegates' lounge. And the reason for this is 
uh, I want, uh, is that uh, we want to try to get the uh, group in one place, and we're all and all the OVO people that are here today are more than, are, are going to be available the entire time. But I will do have one reminder: is that we have a uh, a, a firm deadline of 5:30 to get out of that space. So. Uh, the guards will start coming around uh, 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 around 5:30 and making sure people are shooed away. But th we do look forward to interacting with you individually. And once again, thank you very much for your participation today. Thank you.